the Dinosaur Hour, Sunday the 29th of October at 9 on GB News. What you get for breakfast is something that, if we do our jobs right, you will wake up to news that you didn't know the night before. It's a conversation. It's not just me and Eamon. We want to get to know you, and we want you to get to know us. From 6, it's Breakfast with Eamon and Isabel. Monday to Thursdays on GB News. Britain's news channel. People in Britain, they love free speech, but they also love fair play. I don't care if I'm speaking somebody from a trade union, from the Labour Party, somebody from the SNP. And I think the viewers like to see that actually we can challenge one another, but in a positive way. We think we ask the questions that people want to ask, and often we ask the questions that we wanted to ask in Parliament but never got the chance to ask. So join us every Saturday, 10am till noon, on GB News, Britain's news channel. Nightmare Commute. Kick it up a gear with me, Patrick Christie's, at drive time, 3 till 6 p.m., Monday to Friday, on GB News Radio. You can listen online and on DAB Plus, on the Smart Speaker app, and on the GB News app. And if you've got an Alexa, all you have to say is Alexa, play GB News. We're also on TuneIn and the Radio Player apps. From the school run to rush hour, get revved up with me, Patrick Christie's, on GB News and GB News Radio. Westminster is going around in ever-decreasing circles, followed by the media. Britain is broken. How on earth did we get into this mess? But more importantly, how do we get out of it? Join me at 7pm, Monday to Thursdays, on Farage, here on GB News. We will have open, rational debate. We've got to work out how Britain moves forward from this. Join us here on GB News, the people's channel. Britain is watching. Join me, Andrew Pearce and Bev Turner, Monday to Thursday, 9.30am. Who benefits from that? Not the British public. And on Fridays, join us, Tom Harwood and Ellie Costello from Britain's Newsroom. That's what you get with this show, that's fantastic. If it's happening, we're talking about it on Britain's Newsroom. GB News, Britain's news channel. GB News, unlike other broadcasters, isn't obsessed with the London Westminster bubble. We think there's a nation beyond the M25, and that's why we talk about the issues that matter across the land. Join me on State of the Nation, 8 to 9 o'clock, Monday to Thursday, on GB News. Daisy's listening, and you should too. Now then, Lee Anderson here. Join me on GB News on my show, The Real World, every Friday at 7 p.m. I'm not eating bloody cat. Are you Delicious. Mental? Open your mouth. OK, here comes a, <laughs> here comes a train. It reminds me of the scene in Singing in the Rain. Adam, is that a good one? <laughs> oh, whoa! Join me at 7 on GB News, Britain's news channel. Good afternoon, this is the Live Desk here on GB News. Coming up this Tuesday lunchtime... We've got the very latest in Gaza as more rocket fire is seen near the coast in the last 10 minutes. What will Israel's reaction be? We'll have the latest live from Tel Aviv. It comes as President Biden prepares to fly to Israel and Jordan for crisis talks tomorrow as Iran issues a chilling warning that it could take action in hours if Gaza continues to be bombed. The latest too from Brussels where the terror alert at its highest level after police shot dead a gunman who'd killed two Swedish nationals in the city. We'll also be taking you to Aberdeen as the Scottish First Minister, Humza Yousaf, makes his keynote speech at the SNP's conference, promising £300 million for healthcare in Scotland. First, here's all your latest headlines with Aaron. Very good morning to you. It's uh, midday. I'm Aaron Armstrong in the GB newsroom. A British teenager who's been missing since last weekend's attacks by Hamas has been confirmed dead. 13-year-old Yahel, on the right of your picture, was killed when gunmen attacked her kibbutz on the 7th of October. Yahel was killed along with her mother, Leanne, her elder sister, Noya, and their father, Eli, are still missing. The Prime Minister has called for the immediate release of hostages. It's thought another nine Britons are amongst the 200 people being held by Hamas. The Israeli journalist Yotam Konfino says their outlook is bleak. They are in a horrendous situation, most likely kept underground in tunnels 
by Hamas. That's at least what Israel estimates. So this hostage situation is uh, its really just another humanitarian catastrophe that uh, develops at the same time as uh, what, you know, the atrocities also we see in, in Gaza, not deliberately committed by Israel. Israel says it's not targeting civilians, but we do see these uh, ruins everywhere in Gaza. So these two situations are just simply horrific and not solved yet. At least 60 people have now been killed by Israeli airstrikes in southern Gaza that took place overnight as aid agencies warn of an escalating humanitarian crisis. Palestinian authorities say the attacks took place in Yunus Khan and at the Rafah crossing, where the Israeli military has told civilians to take refuge. The World Health Organization says at least 2,800 people have now been killed in Gaza and 11,000 injured, almost half of those are women and children. Israel believes 600,000 residents have left northern Gaza ahead of the expected ground offensive. The UN believes hospitals in Gaza are on the verge of collapse as the Rafah border crossing to Egypt remains closed. Meanwhile, the US president will visit Israel tomorrow in a show of solidarity as fears grow the war in Gaza could engulf the Middle East. His visit was announced by the US Secretary of State Antony Blinken who himself has been taking part in several days of shuttle diplomacy in the region. Uh, Biden's expected to urge the Prime Minister, Benjamin Netanyahu, to minimise civilian casualties and to establish a humanitarian corridor out of Gaza. Uh, Biden will also meet Arab leaders in an effort to stop the conflict from spreading after Iran pledged to take preemptive action against Israel in the coming hours. It's also been confirmed that Egypt will host a summit to discuss the conflict on Saturday. Police in Brussels have shot dead a gunman suspected of killing two Swedish people last night. It happened in the city centre before Belgium's Euro 2024 qualifier against Sweden. The suspect fired shots from an assault rifle at a taxi. The 45-year-old man, who claimed responsibility in an online video, identified himself as a member of Islamic State. Belgium's Prime Minister, Alexander de Croo, says terrorists cannot be allowed to succeed. Daders, die willen angst. Attackers want to seed fear, distrust and division in our free society. Terrorists have to understand that they will never succeed in this mission. They will never subdue our free society. With their hate and violence, they show above all their powerlessness. Terrorism will never beat us. And this breaking news uh, just into us, a 77-year-old woman has died after being hit by a bus in Manchester city centre. The vehicle crashed into a shop on Monday. Uh, the family of Almena Amica said she was well-loved and her uh, presence will be hugely missed. A 64-year-old man has been bailed on suspicion of causing death by dangerous driving. Google will provide a new AI research centre at the University of Cambridge. The collaboration is said to help with the development of responsible artificial intelligence designed to benefit people. The technology giant is the first... Uh, funding partner for the university's Centre for AI, whose research includes robotics and human-machine interaction. Rolls-Royce is planning to cut up to 2,500 jobs worldwide. The company says it aims to become a more streamlined and efficient business through the process. Uh, Rolls-Royce currently employs 42,000 people, uh, with about half of those in the UK. And you better brace yourself for some bad weather on the way. Yellow warnings in place from tomorrow with the arrival of Storm Babette. It's the second named storm of the season. It's likely to last until the weekend. The Met Office is warning of flooding, power cuts and travel disruption. And the warning will cover much of Scotland, the eastern part of Northern Ireland, as well as the north and east of England. We're live across the UK on TV, digital radio. If you want us on your smart speaker, just say play GB News. Now it's over to Mark and Pip. Aaron, thank you and welcome back to the live desk. Uh, we're just going to bring you the uh, latest live picture we've got from Gaza because uh, to the left of the picture, uh, we've seen more rocket fire in the last 10, 15 minutes uh, from a building very near to uh, the beach, uh, one of these big high-rise buildings, uh, which does seem significant, bearing in mind that um, Israeli airstrikes have been trying to target these uh, various rockets being fired, um, either homemade uh, or uh, brought 
brought in uh, from uh, the various tunnel systems underneath. Um, we've counted on our feed uh, at least six to seven rockets being fired. Uh, no indication yet, of course, as to what the Israeli response may be to that, although there have been Israeli airstrikes in the south of Gaza in the Rafa area. This is all happening as this constant diplomacy continues within the last few hours. The news that President Joe Biden, he is heading to the region uh, for talks to hear about plans for a ground attack in Gaza. And also it is hoped um, to tell Israel that they have to be so careful uh, with their plans because the UN Human Rights Office is warning that Israel's evacuation order could be an illegal forcible transfer of civilians. Those civilians heading south, tens of thousands of them, down to uh, the Khan Yunis area where people are sleeping in the streets, uh, there's hardly any running water, and that cross that vital access into Egypt, that Rafa crossing is still shut. People cannot get out and humanitarian aid cannot come in. Well, let's get the views now of uh, former director of Labour Friends of Israel, David Mensah, who can join us live from Tel Aviv. And, David, we were just uh, updating people with that rocket fire being seen from Gaza. I mean, it may surprise people that uh, it appears Hamas has still got the, the capability of launching those rockets. Those rockets which you're talking about are aimed at me. They're aimed at my family. They're aimed at my people. They're aimed at this country. They're aimed, they're targeted at civilian areas, at civilian areas designed specifically to kill as many people as they possibly can. It's only thanks to uh, Israel's miraculous Iron Dome missile defense system that those rockets are being knocked out of the sky. Myself and my family have been in and out of our bomb shelter many times yesterday evening. It is, it is causing tremendous trauma to the young people. But of course, let's not forget that this entire episode, this latest chapter, and I would say this last chapter of Israel's battle against the genocide, genocidal death cult of Hamas, of the ISIS-like group of Hamas, started when 1,400 of my people, unarmed, Innocent people going about their daily lives, just waking up on the Shabbat morning, on the Sabbath morning, on a Jewish holiday, were mercilessly massacred in uh, scenes which are actually worse than the Nazis did. The Nazis, of course, tried hard to uh, hide their crimes. Hamas, on the other, on the other hand, live streamed their crimes on Facebook, on TikTok, on Telegram. This is the barbarity of the enemy we are facing. We are facing it here in Israel, but the people of Britain should know as well that this enemy will not uh, stay here in, in between Gaza and Israel. It will come to you soon if this barbarity is not stopped. Yeah, should we also reflect, of course, that there have been Israeli airstrikes on Rafah in the southern Gaza Strip with uh, pictures of, of Palestinians searching for their families who've been injured there. Um, and there had been a hope, perhaps, with President Biden visiting tomorrow, that diplomacy might start to win the day rather than uh, these airstrikes from both sides. The address for criticism about civilians being, har being harmed in Gaza should go directly to Hamas, not to Israel, directly to Hamas. Poverty in the Gaza Strip should go directly attributable to Hamas. Ham uh, Gaza should look like Monaco with the amount of aid which has been pouring into that strip. The poor people living in Gaza are poor because of Hamas. They have problems with their water supply because water pipes, which were donated by the international community, were dug up to be used as missiles to fire at my people. Now, the Jewish people, we recognize evil when we see it. We recognize barbarity when we see it. We've seen it before aimed at us, and this is exactly what's happening right now. This barbarity needs to be stood up to, and believe you me, Israel has been shocked by this attack and it most definitely has been extremely unsettled. These are scenes which we've never thought we'd ever see again. But believe you me, this will be the last chapter of Hamas. What do you say to, um, I think it's the UN Human Rights Office, David, that is claiming this, this Israeli evacuation order could be illegal? People forcibly 
being moved, the forcible transfer of tens of thousands of civilians could be an international war crime. What do you think of that claim? I would say to the United Nations, their primary, prim, primary role right now, as well as looking after the uh, civilians in Gaza have been told to move away, to get out of harm's way, their primarily, primary responsibility right now should be rescuing the hostages, Israel's innocence that have been taken. This morning, I attended a press conference uh, of one of the poor young ladies that was uh, a 21-year-old girl that was kidnapped and is being held against her will. To see the look of pain on her mother's face, on her brother, on her two brothers, on her family's face, the psychological warfare uh, which is being imposed on the people of Israel, that should be the primary role of the United Nations right now. The United Nations, unfortunately, in this part of the world, is not an innocent bystander. We well, know there, there are obviously agencies that, that would take issue with what you're saying on that. But can I just get your thoughts, uh, David, on what you just said on um, this announcement from Turkey that it's actually in talks with Hamas on the release of what it says are foreigners, civilians, and children held hostage? Hakan Fidan, the foreign minister, speaking to Ismail Haniyeh, who I think is, is based in Qatar. Um, do you have any hope that negotiation would work in any way? Of course, negotiation should be the first port of call in this shocking situation created by Hamas. But people should listen to my voice very, very clearly now. Hostages taken by Jew haters are priority number one. This country will not leave its people behind. History has shown us that when hostages are taken from the Jewish people, we will do everything in our power, and I mean everything in our power, to get them back. Witness, of course, the famous Entebbe rescue in the early 1970s, and even uh, the poor parents of dead soldiers who are asking for their uh, sons' bodies back. These are not forgotten. These are high up in the daily headlines here in Israel. We will not forget the hostages here in Israel. People of Israel will put their arms around these poor families, and we will do everything to bring those hostages back. And how do you see this ending, David, we know there is likely to be this, this huge ground incursion, but long term, where do you see peace or when do you see peace happening? I see peace happening when Hamas are obliterated. Then peace talks can begin. Do you think that's possible to obliterate Hamas, to crush that, that ideology? I don't think you're listening to me. Israel has suffered the most heinous crime. The people of Israel demand, all right-thinking pe right people demand that this genocidal bunch of murderers are obliterated from the face of the earth. And believe you me, it will happen. Now, Israel will always, always put their hand out, one hand, hand out to peace. That is in our nature. We wish to live in peace in this region. We, of course, that one of the reasons why this entire uh, terrible thing has happened is because we were getting closer peace, particularly with Saudi Arabia. We knew that the genocidal murderers in Hamas and in Iran, their principal uh, funders, didn't want that to happen, which is why they launched this attack. So we will always try our hardest for peace. But in the words of King David, there is a time for peace and a time for war. And right now, it's time to obliterate Hamas, and obliterate David, this evil. I, I hear Earth. you. I hear you, and I'm listening to you very clearly. All, all I'm questioning you on is when you say ob obliterate Hamas, I'm just asking how realistic that could be in terms of absolutely crushing them because they could be replaced by somebody or something else. Let me ask you a question in return then. What did Britain do in response to ISIS? What did the United States do in response to ISIS? What did the European Union do in response to ISIS and Daesh? They obliterated them. They no longer exist. The same thing will happen with our own homegrown version of Hamas. They will be obliterated. Of course, peace is always forefront in our mind. 
It's the very essence of our identity. We wish to live in peace with all of the ne our neighbours in this region. I myself have taken 70 members of parliament down into Gaza to see the reality of life uh, in Gaza for that peace. But what I've never seen in all the years when I've been watching Gaza... Yeah, David, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt you. We're just seeing pictures of, of more rocket fire, and we've also seen explosions, uh, we believe, in Gaza, uh, to the southern area of the Strip, across the border from Sterot. Um, uh, let, me, let me return to one of the first questions we asked you um, with, seemingly, the, the aerial warfare still going on. Is there any chance, with Biden coming in tomorrow, of diplomacy winning the day? I still don't feel that you understand what Hamas is. Hamas is a genocidal death cult. It's not interested in diplomacy. Uh, the time for diplomacy with Hamas is long gone. Uh, the people that go into a music festival in the desert and mow down 260 innocent dancers uh, dancing until the dawn, uh, those are not people with which you carry out diplomacy. Hamas yeah. need to be defeated. And mark my words, they will be defeated. Right, there David, is, of course, thank you. always a role in diplomacy. Yeah, thank you for your response, because we're now going to speak to former Israeli Justice Minister on the very uh, topics that you've been raising there. Yossi Balin can also uh, join us. Um, Yossi, thank you for your time. Let, let me just put the point that we're putting there to, to David about Biden arriving tomorrow uh, and whether there is a place for diplomacy now or whether the feelings are so raw in Israel, as we just heard, that basically uh, Hamas has to be removed from the picture for people to, to move forward. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm really in a very uh, sad situation because usually, I mean, all my life, I, I try to find compromises and I always believe that uh, one can establish the common denom denominator and I be believe in win-win rather than in, in zero sum. But the situation right now is really impossible. There is no chance now for any diplomacy. I mean, what, what uh, Daesh, uh, the, the, the ISIS uh, wants, uh, or, or, or Hamas, which is, in my view, also the same, is to the annihilation of Israel. And this is not something that we cannot compromise on. So I believe that this stage of, uh, of an attack, whenever it happens in the coming uh, days, is inevitable. And uh, only then, when the Hamas is not ruling Gaza, there will be a, an opportunity to uh, go back to the negotiating table uh, if our government is ready for that. Right. So, so where does that leave the hostages, bearing in mind Turkey says it's talking as we speak with the Hamas leadership, or at least Ismail Haniyeh, who, of course, is, is in Qatar? Um, should that be disregarded as well? It cannot be dis disregarded. I'm sure that this is a major issue for any Israeli government. This has been the issue since ever and also now. I am not uh, privy to the details. I don't know what is happening about it, but I know that there is a work of, of uh, talking uh, about uh, releasing uh, prisoners, and I hope that it will take place. But I don't believe that uh, it will delay the attack on uh, Gaza whenever it takes place. What about uh, the threat posed by Iran, Yossi? Their, their supreme leader is saying that there will be resistance and then we could be in big trouble, couldn't we? Well, I, I'm, I think that uh, this is the time for threats from uh, Iran, it was expected. And uh, I believe that, uh, that Israel is ready and that the world is ready, because I think that what is happening today, the fact that leaders from the West are coming to Israel, uh, and first and foremost, the American president, means that they see what is happening with, uh, with Hamas as a threat to the West, to the, to the Western civilization, and not only uh, to Israel uh, itself. So with all due respect uh, to Iran, uh, this will not deter Israel for taking the needed 
regretfully, but the needed steps in order to put back the PLO, the Palestinian Authority, or, or other uh, Arab uh, uh, players uh, as, as uh, leading Gaza towards uh, rehabilitation, renovation, building it again, and, and uh, being part of the Palestinian uh, uh, body which will negotiate with Israel for a permanent agreement of a two-state solution. Given uh, what you and others have said then about um, Hamas, the, the threat that's posed, the existential uh, state of the, of the threat that's posed, how did Israel get it so wrong in missing the warning signs about what Hamas was about to launch? Well, this is a story which goes back many, many years. I mean, for me, launching the Oslo process was mainly or at least one of the, of the most important reasons, the, the, the flourishing of Hamas in those years of the early 90s, when I saw that more and more young Palestinians began to support Hamas rather than the, the PLO. Yeah. So in Hamas, a young and honest group rather than the very cumbersome and, and the, a dishonest PLO in their eyes. But I understood that uh, with Hamas, we don't have any common denominator. While with the Palestinian national uh, uh, movement, even if it sees things very differently than ourselves, there would always be a compromise, theoretically. And uh, eventually, we found a compromise in the Oslo uh, Agreement. So the right in Israel saw in Hamas a right partner to have no peace because Hamas was never ready to, uh, to uh, right. divide the land, to partition the land with, uh, with Israel. And this is what they were against, too. Right, so that begs the question, what happens now about the Palestinian cause in this, which, of course, is, is largely now with the West Bank uh, and Mahmoud Abbas? Is there a place for the Palestinian Authority to be, well, reinserted, if you like, into Gaza? They should. They should. I mean, it was taken from them in 2007 by force, by cruelty, and it should be given back to them. Eventually, when we have the agreement, the permanent agreement, uh, Gaza for sure will be part of the Palestinian state uh, with a safe uh, passage to the, to the West Bank. This is our agreement. So I, I believe that uh, as soon as possible, if it is possible now, I mean, after the war, which I hope will not take uh, very long, that uh, the Palestinians will, the, the Palestinian Authority will return to, the, to Gaza and rule it. The last thing that, uh, that I believe not only me, but even the rightist people would like to see is the, re the return of the occupation, of the direct occupation of Israel on the, uh, on Ga the Gaza Strip. What about the future? of Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. So many questions being asked of him. How long do you think he's got left now I would not, in power? I would not like to be in his shoes right now. And, and does that uh, go for the uh, people around him, the coalition that's been formed, this war cabinet effectively, because uh, clearly, sure, uh, as, they, as, they as you've indicated, it, it is a question of survival for the moment. Right now, uh, we are all united at war, but uh, it will not uh, take too long. And uh, once the war is open, then there will be an investigation uh, committee, an inquiry committee, and uh, things will, will be very uh, quickly uh, exposed. Uh, I don't think that this government has the, the moral right to uh, prevail as is uh, after the war. OK, well, Yossi uh, Belin, former Israeli Justice Minister, thank you for joining us there uh, in Tel Aviv. And, of course, we will continue to monitor and report on the events in the days to come and perhaps speak to you once again. Thank you very much for your time. You are with uh, the live desk here on GB News. Coming up, we'll be bringing you the latest from Brussels, uh, where a man was shot dead and two Swedish nationals were killed. We'll have the latest with our security editor. Stay with us. Who is it? <laughs> <laughs> 
We're here for the show. More energy this time! Welcome to the Dinosaur Hour. I was uh, married to a therapist. And you survived? I thought we were getting Hugh Laurie. Second best. <laughs> you interviewed Saddam Hussein. What's that like? I was terrified. I'm playing strip poker with these three. Oh! No, thank you. <laughs> My CDs need to be put in alphabetical order. Ah. Uh, are you going to be problematic again? <laughs> the Dinosaur Hour, Sunday the 29th of October at 9 on GB News. What you get for breakfast is something that, if we do our jobs right, you will wake up to news that you didn't know the night before. It's a conversation. It's not just me and Eamon. We want to get to know you, and we want you to get to know us. From 6, it's Breakfast with Eamon and Isabel. Monday to Thursdays on GB News. Britain's news channel. People in Britain, they love free speech, but they also love fair play. I don't care if I'm speaking somebody from a trade union, from the Labour Party, somebody from the SNP. And I think the viewers like to see that actually we can challenge one another, but in a positive way. We think we ask the questions that people want to ask, and often we ask the questions that we wanted to ask in Parliament but never got the chance to ask. So join us every Saturday, 10am till noon on GB News. Britain's news channel. Nightmare Commute. Kick it up a gear with me, Patrick Christie's, at drive time, 3 till 6 p.m., Monday to Friday, on GB News Radio. You can listen online and on DAB+, Plus on the Smart Speaker app and on the GB News app. And if you've got an Alexa, all you have to say is, Alexa, play GB News. We're also on TuneIn and the Radio Player apps. From the school run to rush hour, get revved up with me, Patrick Christie's, on GB News and GB News Radio. Westminster is going around in ever-decreasing circles, followed by the media. Britain is broken. How on earth did we get into this mess? But more importantly, how do we get out of it? Join me at 7pm, Monday to Thursdays, on Farage, here on GB News. We will have open, rational debate. We've got to work out how Britain moves forward from this. Join us here on GB News, the people's channel. Britain is watching. Join me, Andrew Pearce and Bev Turner, Monday to Thursday, 9.30am. Who benefits from that? Not the British public. And on Fridays, join us, Tom Harwood and Ellie Costello from Britain's Newsroom. That's what you get with this show, that's fantastic. If it's happening, we're talking about it on Britain's Newsroom. GB News, Britain's news channel. GB News, unlike other broadcasters, isn't obsessed with the London Westminster bubble. We think there's a nation beyond the M25, and that's why we talk about the issues that matter across the land. Join me on State of the Nation, 8 to 9 o'clock, Monday to Thursday, on GB News. Daisy's listening, and you should too. Now then, Lee Anderson here. Join me on GB News on my show, The Real World, every Friday at 7 p.m. I'm not eating bloody cat. Are you Delicious. Open your mouth. OK, here comes, a, here comes a train. Reminds me of the scene in Singing in the Rain. Adam, is that a good one? Oh, whoa! Join me at 7 on GB News, Britain's news channel. Very good afternoon to you. It's 12.30. I'm Aaron Armstrong in the GB Newsroom. Uh, let's get you up to date with uh, the latest headlines. One of the British teenagers missing since last weekend's attack by Hamas has been confirmed dead. 13-year-old Yahel, on the right of your picture, was killed when gunmen attacked her kibbutz on the 7th of October. Yahel died along with her mother, Leanne, while her elder sister, Noya, and their father, Eli, remain missing. The Prime Minister has called for the immediate release of hostages held by Hamas. It's thought another nine Britons are amongst some 200 people being held. At least 60 people have been killed by Israeli airstrikes in southern Gaza overnight as aid agencies warn of an escalating humanitarian crisis. Palestinian authorities say the attacks took place in Yunus Khan and near the Rafah border crossing, uh, where the Israeli military has told civilians to take refuge. The World Health Organization says at least 2,800 people have now been killed in Gaza and almost 11,000 have been injured. The hospitals, according to the United Nations, are on the verge of collapse, with aid workers overwhelmed and supplies running out. The Rafah border crossing into Egypt remains closed. Police in Brussels have shot dead a gunman suspected of killing two Swedish people 
in the capital last night. It happened in the city centre before Belgium's Euro 2024 qualifier against Sweden. The suspect fired shots from an assault rifle at a taxi. A 45-year-old man who claimed responsibility in an online video identified himself as a member of Islamic State. The terror threat level has been raised in Brussels to its highest level. And wages are now rising faster than prices for the first time in nearly two years. Average regular earnings increased by 7.8% in the first uh, three months to August. Uh, Chancellor Jeremy Hunt says it's good news. Inflation is falling, but says the government will continue to tackle inflation. Labour's shadow chancellor, though, says the Tory party are leaving people worse off with low growth and high taxes. More on all of our stories on our website, gbnews.com. Uh, let's update you now on uh, events in Europe uh, with perhaps a direct uh, correlation with what's happened in the Middle East with police in Brussels shooting a man who'd killed two Swedish nationals on Monday evening. Local media reporting the man uh, shot outside a cafe this morning. Brussels has been on its highest terror alert after last night's attack. In response, Prime Minister Alexander de Cruz said terrorists must understand that they will never succeed in their intent. Let's get more with our Home and Security Editor Mark White joining us now. And Mark, as we've been reporting in Brussels, the terror alert at its highest ever. Uh, and I guess a key question for them, is this one of these so-called lone wolf attacks or is there a, a, a wider ramification here? Well, I think there is significant concern in countries right across Europe and indeed in the US as well uh, about the potential for incidents that might unfold as a direct re response to what's happening in Israel and Gaza at the moment. And this incident itself, it unfolded last night after 7 o'clock uh, in the evening local time when uh, this man went on the rampage armed with an automatic rifle uh, targeting, according to authorities, they believe specifically those Swedish football fans that were in that city for the European qualifier. Uh, as Sweden were, of course, playing Belgium last night. Uh, and looking for those individuals who were wearing Swedish tops. Now, the reason that Sweden is significant, it's been grappling with a very significant problem uh, in recent years, actually, uh, related to the migration crisis, asylum seekers who they are blaming for uh, a rise and a spike in mm. uh, serious crime in that country. We've had Koran burnings mm. in Sweden that have inflamed uh, many uh, Muslims and some real concern about the potential for Swedish citizens being targeted. Take that against the backdrop of what's happening uh, in Israel as well. This individual, who's been named as Abdesalam Lassoud, um, was an asylum seeker uh, from Tunisia. He had been denied asylum in 2019 and effectively disappeared off the radar, was wanted uh, by the police uh, for people smuggling offences. Um, and in a video that uh, he apparently made, you know, it's been largely circulated uh, after the attack, he had said that he was being motivated out of his support for uh, the Islamic State and also partly as an act of revenge for the killing of yeah. a Palestinian teenager in the US in recent days. It seemed to take quite a long time to, to apprehend him, some 12 hours or more. Yeah, well, he disappeared on a moped. Uh, he was he was off very quickly. It's, it's very difficult, you know, if someone's on foot and they're continuing to attack while the police arrive, uh, which is an MO for a lot of terrorists because they actually want to be mar martyred. Mm. Uh, but if someone decides to disappear uh, off on you know, some kind of transport out of the area, it can be a while before the authorities get a handle on who the individual is uh, and where they might be. Well, they traced him to uh, a cafe in central Brussels uh, this morning and uh, there was a confrontation. Uh, this man was still armed with the assault rifle that he used to carry out the deadly attack. 
Uh, the police shot him. Uh, they worked on him for a while, the medics, uh, but he died later in hospital. And, and I guess um, the, the fact that he uh, issued this video, he um, espoused this uh, link to Islamic State or alleged link, that clearly will ring the alarm bells across Europe. There will be many police forces now looking through their list of individuals or known individuals and assessing their movements and trying to work out what's going on. Yes, because, I mean, remember, the, the, the threat from Islamic State, uh, ISIS, mm. has never gone away, yeah, yeah. really. It's been significantly degraded. I was interested to listen to the interview you did with David Mercer, I think, in... Mercer. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Um, and, you know, he was talking about what, what did the, uh, the Western world do in response to uh, ISIS and al-Qaeda. Uh, now, of course, that was to go after them mm. uh, and try to destroy them. But they never have, and you well, know that was, it's, that was it's a question yeah, about can you an actually crush yeah. them? Yeah. And it's a very pertinent point because, you know, they can severely degrade Hamas. Of course they can, but actually, taking them completely mm. out of the picture uh, is next to impossible. And in some way, shape, or form, at some point, you know, they will continue to grow again, as we see with ISIS. Yeah. So, uh, on that point, really about the potential threat, ISIS, of course poses a threat, Al-Qaeda still poses a threat, and Al-Qaeda, uh, just in recent days, has put its support behind Hamas. Yeah. Just uh, on um, a, a detailed question, what is the position about the state of alert in Britain at the moment, and do we know if it's being looked at? It's always being looked at. The Joint Terrorism Analysis Centre, which is made up of the uh, intelligence agencies and others yeah. uh, who are constantly analysing the potential threat from individuals. Remember, they have 800 live investigations currently underway. Yeah. Lots of people they're tracking. But in terms of raising that threat, it's a substantial at the moment, right. which is the sort of medium point, mm. uh, meaning an attack is likely. Uh, if it's it goes up to severe, yeah. that would mean an attack is highly likely. Yeah. The highest level, which is what Brussels is at yeah. at the moment, mm. Uh, they're slightly different scale, but ours is critical, meaning effectively we are in the midst of a terrorist attack. The uh, terrorists are still at large, could, you know, launch another attack any time. That would only be instigated in these raising of the terror threat levels would only be instigated uh, if they have yeah. enough intelligence to and suggest... And we have to jump two levels to get there. Yeah, I mean, yeah. it may well go up to severe. I right. think there's, there, there's a fairly strong chance that that might happen because there is real concern yeah. Yeah. across Europe that the events in Israel and in Gaza are going to inspire and trigger those that might want to cause people harm in Europe. Mark, thank you very much indeed for updating uh, us on that. And, of course, more as we get it. Uh, and uh, more from the live pictures, of course, yeah. we get it from Gaza. And as we show you those live pictures, uh, more smoke, as you can see, uh, rockets being fired, we believe, uh, from Gaza towards Israel. Uh, Reuters is now reporting that tomorrow Jordan will host a four-party summit with the US President Joe Biden and Egyptian and Palestinian leaders to discuss the dangerous repercussions of the war in the region and to discuss finding a political resolution. This is The Live Desk. Stay with us. I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to ordinary people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels. We're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. The Live Desk with me, Mark Longhurst. And me, Pip Thompson. It's here Monday to Friday on GB News. From midday, we'll bring you the news as it breaks, whenever it's happening and wherever it's happening, from across the UK and around the world. Refreshing, feisty, but with a bit of fun too. If it matters to you, we'll have it covered on TV, radio and online. Join the Live Desk on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. 
So Jubes and Co, we tackle the issues of the day with real robust debate, both sides of the fence, battling it out with me in the middle with my forthright opinions and views. And often really interesting things happen because you start with a position and then by the end of the debate, you find actually, well, I might not have thought about that one. What we need in this country is two new political parties. You should maybe think about doing a 2024 calendar. <coughs> I'm Michelle Jubry and I'm keeping you company right through until seven o'clock this evening. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's watching. Join us every night on GB News at 11pm for Headliners, which is three top comedians going through the next day's news stories, which is exactly what you need, because when the establishment has gone crazy, you need some craziness to make sense of it. Headliners, you don't have to bother reading the newspaper, we've got it covered for you. Every night at 11pm and repeated every morning at 5am. We won't send you to sleep like some of the other paper review shows out there. So join us 11pm every night on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Join me, Camilla Tomini, on Sunday mornings from 9.30, taking the politicians to task and breaking out of SW1 to see how their decisions are affecting you across the UK. Bursting the Westminster bubble every Sunday morning, only on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's watching. Every Sunday from 11, join Michael Portillo. There will be topical discussion, looking at the week before and the week to come. So kick back and relax at 11 a.m. on Sundays on GB News with me, Michael Portillo. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Nightmare Commute. Kick it up a gear with me, Patrick Christie's, at drive time, 3 till 6 p.m., Monday to Friday on GB News Radio. You can listen online and on DAB Plus on the Smart Speaker app and on the GB News app. And if you've got an Alexa, all you have to say is Alexa, play GB News. We're also on TuneIn and the Radio Player apps. From the school run to rush hour, get revved up with me, Patrick Christie's, on GB News and GB News Radio. Welcome back to the live desk. Uh, for so many Israelis, life will never be the same again after last week's terrorist attack, with many having to move from their communities with, well, absolutely no timeline on when they might be able to return home. Well, one of them, Adel Rehmer, hid in the security room, the so-called safe room in her kibbutz, kibbutz Nirim, as Hamas terrorists infiltrated. Uh, she can now speak to us, and thank you very much indeed uh, for joining us to, to tell us your story. Um, and just to pick up on that uh, description of a safe room, I guess for you and many other who've lived in these circumstances, that will now have to be reassessed as to whether there is such a thing as a, a safe space. So thank you for hosting me here. You know, when they put in the safe rooms, I got my safe room something like 2011. And I asked the person who was in charge of security, how do you lock it? He said, well, you don't. It, it, you can't because then if something happens to you and you're inside, the first responders won't be able to come and rescue yeah, you. Yeah. Mm. I said, but what about infiltration? And he, he had no answer. And there are people who have put external locks on the windows, uh, sorry, on the doors. We're going to have to absolutely, the security, whole security situation is going to have to be reassessed there to make it safe for us because... My country built an impermeable, impermeable fence going an underground barrier and a fence that was supposed to be keeping us safe. Clearly, it did not. And does that mean when there is, and we do hope there will be peace again, that even an area like a kibbutz will have to have some kind of defensive ring around it, that it, it will no longer be uh, assessed as, as, as a normal place of safety? We already have a defensive ring around us. We have a fence, yeah, a, yeah. an electro electronic fence with, with sensors on it. I don't, there's, there's a limit to how much you can fortify yourself. Mm -hmm. And now the job is to get rid of the Hamas. 
That's the only way that we will be able to feel safe again. If the Hamas infrastructure, the terror group Hamas infrastructure is neutralized. Adele, just, just to give our viewers and listeners an idea, how close was your kibbutz to the Gaza border? And was your security something that you thought about on a very regular basis? Or was it really at the back of your mind generally? So we were about a mile away from the border, about two kilometers. And I, of course, thought of my security, but I felt, I felt secure. Mm. I would get in my car. I like photography. And I would get in my car of a Friday evening and go out into the fields without any qualms, feeling totally safe, and, ta and take pictures. Mm. And... That, that's a show. I have a friend from my kibbutz next door who was walking out in the field on a sunrise walk at 6.30 in the morning on sun, Saturday, October 7th. She's gone. She's missing. We don't know where she or her husband are. We, we are just so, so sorry. And that day, 10 days ago, how many hours did you stay in the safe room if it didn't lock? What was it your physical strength? I mean, we've, we've read many stories about how people kept that door shut for hours upon hours. Dumb luck, divine intervention or my late husband watching above. What is they your did, thought? They tried to infiltrate my house. They tried yeah. to infiltrate my house. Yeah. Uh, my son was with me. He understands a little bit Arabic and he said he could hear them talking and saying to what someone said to the other, come away from there. About an hour later, when I tried to open the door because I had to go to the bathroom, we'd been in there for hours already, I, I saw that the, the blinds, the slats on my window had been busted. Mm. So they tried to infiltrate and something caused them to move on. My, my son-in-law was not as lucky and then terrorists infiltrated his house with my three young grandchildren in the safe room. He told them to hide under the blanket. He opened the door to the safe room and shot the terrorists with his own hands. But he was, and then tried to went at, go after other terrorists, but realized that there were just too many highly armed terrorists outside and, and came back. But, but there was a terrorist body right outside his door for hours and hours. Uh, Adele, last thought for you. Um, clearly, what's happened has effectively infiltrated everybody's lives in Israel. It's consequence now for, for everybody there. What do you believe should and could happen now? We've got President Biden arriving tomorrow. Is there still a chance for diplomacy, or is it that there, there has to be this battle? You know, I'm, I've always been the first to say conflicts like this cannot be solved with weapons, they have to be solved by diplomacy. And, and I have friends in Gaza that I'm in touch with and I'm terribly concerned about their lives. But after the slaughter of over 1,300 Israelis 10 days ago, unfortunately, this is not time for diplomacy. First of all, as I said, the Hamas terrorist infra uh, infrastructure needs to be neutralized. Only after that will we be able to start thinking about diplomacy. And I hope we do, because I want my neighbors to thrive and have good lives. That's all I want for them, just like I want for myself. We, yeah. we can be really good neighbors. Adele Raymer, we, uh, we so appreciate you coming on. We've run out of time, unfortunately, but uh, your thoughts... Um, have just been invaluable. So thank you so much. And we do wish you all the very best for the future. We really do. Thank you very much for having me and letting my voice, our voices be heard. We'll, we'll speak to you again. Thanks very much indeed. Uh, but let's uh, reflect now on uh, events that have been taking place here in London with the Palestinian ambassador, Zom Zomlet, uh, holding a news conference in which he said, uh, this is not a war on Hamas, but the people of Palestine. So clearly a different perspective uh, from this news conference. Our reporter, Thea Chikomba, was there and uh, we can hear from him now. Uh, and clearly this is a, a, an important issue um, as uh, both sides discuss this. Does this involve the Palestinians? Does it involve Hamas as a separate entity? 
Yes, well, a very good afternoon to you. In the press conference, which lasted just over an hour here in central London, the UK's Palestinian ambassador was direct in his tour. This is the very first thing he said. He rejects uh, the targeting of civilians. International law and humanitarian laws must be respected. And he went on to talk about the amount of children that have died, a thousand children killed, he said. He also went on to say Palestinians are being killed every five minutes and people are waiting for hours uh, just to get water. So in his talk today, it was particularly uh, poignant. He was talking about how this is, an Im this is impacting on civilians, people needing to go to hospital, uh, cancer treatment and babies and incubators. And he was saying uh, we need an immediate ceasefire. When asked about whether he's um, been speaking to many people across the world when it comes to diplomats and, of course, some of his colleagues, he says, yes, that's something we're doing constantly. And then he also touched on the importance of the UK government uh, having the right message. He said he wasn't too happy with the initial message uh, that was put out by uh, James Clevery, the Foreign Secretary, uh, but has praised Rishi Sunak in the last couple of days. But he said that's a message that needed to be put out at the very beginning. We've also heard from those in Ramallah, a palace. Palestinian city. Medical staff have joined a protest uh, with families of Palestinian prisoners. They said this, we stand with our people in Gaza. We stand with paramedics who are being targeted while on duty. And this is something that they say needs to be urgently sorted out. And also the ambassador touched on today that the door needs to be opened to the international community, the Red Cross and the U UN as well, so that we are able to get uh, verified information there on the ground. But as as you say, uh, it's very much about uh, civilians today and is saying those are the families and the people across uh, Gaza uh, and the various uh, states of Palestine who are being uh, targeted. Theo Chikomba, thank you very much. Let's uh, go straight to our political editor, Christopher Hope, because the Prime Minister has confirmed that at least uh, six Britons died and another nine are missing following uh, that terrorist attack by Hamas. Uh, one 13-year-old girl was killed. Her name uh, was this, Yahel. Yahel, yeah, and, and uh, uh, killed with a mum, Leanne. Yeah. And all this comes as Downing Street has urged Israel to allow water into Gaza. Uh, let's talk to Christopher Hope. Christopher, um, very aware now that President Joe Biden in, is heading uh, to Israel tomorrow. Uh, we're also seeing that the German Chancellor is heading there as well. Uh, are there plans for the Prime Minister to go now? Uh, not, not imminently, Pippa. We've asked, we've tried to get guidance on that. Nothing planned imminently, but of course we'll be the first to tell you on GB News if a trip is planned. Um, we had the first confirmation from the cabinet meeting behind me, started at half past nine, around till 11, when the PM, Rishi Sunak, talked about suspected abduction of British nationals. That's language he did not use yesterday in the House of Commons. For the first time, they are saying abduction of British nationals. We didn't, didn't know it before. They told us briefly there there were uh, 10 missing British nationals, six um, on, on top of that are, are dead. So but we, they wouldn't tell us how many hostages are being held in, in, in Gaza by Hamas. Yes, as you say, President Biden to visit uh, Israel tomorrow. Um, <clears throat> the working assumption is that that is a briefing ahead of the land invasion. So the US government will be briefed on what the Israelis are planning to do when they do launch this much mooted and much planned invasion. Um, today, here in, in Parliament, we've had um, a visit from, by, by uh, three women from, from Israel, came over one woman there um, who, who was missing uh, 12 members of her family, that's 12 members of her family, and given that there are only 200 being held um, by Hamas officially, that is, uh, uh, I think you're seeing some footage now of people we spoke to earlier. We'll play out those interviews in the next hour. Deeply moving. They met today with uh, Sir Keir Starmer, David Lamy, Shadow, Shadow Foreign Secretary, uh, Lisa Nandy, the Shadow Aid Secretary, um, Angela Rayner, the Deputy Leader. And they, they stress the need for more Red Cross to allowed, be allowed in, into Gaza. Currently, that's a big issue for them. And they are seeking, of course, meetings with the Prime Minister. They said they only allowed a meeting there with the Middle East Minister, Lord Ahmed, not with the PM yet. But more meetings are planned, I think, in behind me, but uh, it's been a difficult day, a moving day here in Westminster for these families. Indeed. Chris, thank you very much indeed uh, for that. More from you a little later. Uh, let's bring you in the latest pictures we've got after rocket fire again being seen uh, from Gaza.
cars are being fired into uh, Israel. Uh, an indication, meanwhile, from Turkey that it's uh, trying to uh, get talks with Hamas to get the various hostages released. We'll have the very latest live for you here on the live desk. Who is it? We're here for the show. More energy this time. Welcome to the Dinosaur Hour. I was uh, married to a therapist. And you survived? I thought we were getting Hugh Laurie. Second best. <laughs> you interviewed Saddam Hussein. What's that like? I was terrified. I'm playing strip poker with these three. Oh! No, thank you. <laughs> My CDs need to be put in alphabetical order. Ah. Uh, Are you going to be problematic again? <laughs> the Dinosaur Hour. Sunday, the 29th of October at 9 on GB News. What you get for breakfast is something that, if we do our jobs right, you will wake up to news that you didn't know the night before. It's a conversation. It's not just me and Eamon. We want to get to know you, and we want you to get to know us. From 6, it's Breakfast with Eamon and Isabel. Monday to Thursdays on GB News. Britain's news channel. People in Britain, they love free speech, but they also love fair play. I don't care if I'm speaking somebody from a trade union, from the Labour Party, somebody from the SNP. And I think the viewers like to see that actually we can challenge one another, but in a positive way. We think we ask the questions that people want to ask, and often we ask the questions that we wanted to ask in Parliament but never got the chance to ask. So join us every Saturday, 10am till noon on GB News. Britain's news channel. Nightmare Commute. Kick it up a gear with me, Patrick Christie's, at drive time, 3 till 6 p.m., Monday to Friday, on GB News Radio. You can listen online and on DAB+, Plus on the smart speaker app, and on the GB News app. And if you've got an Alexa, all you have to say is, Alexa, play GB News. We're also on TuneIn and the Radio Player apps. From the school run to rush hour, get revved up with me, Patrick Christie's, on GB News and GB News Radio. Westminster is going around in ever-decreasing circles, followed by the media. Britain is broken. How on earth did we get into this mess? But more importantly, how do we get out of it? Join me at 7pm, Monday to Thursdays, on Farage, here on GB News. We will have open, rational debate. We've got to work out how Britain moves forward from this. Join us here on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain is watching. Join me, Andrew Pearce and Bev Turner, Monday to Thursday, 9.30am. Who benefits from that? Not the British public. And on Fridays, join us, Tom Harwood and Ellie Costello from Britain's Newsroom. That's what you get with this show, that's fantastic. If it's happening, we're talking about it on Britain's Newsroom. GB News, Britain's news channel. GB News, unlike other broadcasters, isn't obsessed with the London Westminster bubble. We think there's a nation beyond the M25, and that's why we talk about the issues that matter across the land. Join me on State of the Nation, 8 to 9 o'clock, Monday to Thursday, on GB News. Daisy's listening, and you should too. Now then, Lee Anderson here. Join me on GB News on my show, The Real World, every Friday at 7 p.m. I'm not eating bloody cat. Are you Delicious. Mental? Open your mouth. OK, here comes, a, <laughs> here comes a train. Reminds me of the scene in Singing in the Rain. Adam, is that a good one? Oh, oh. Join me at 7 on GB News, Britain's news channel. Good afternoon, this is the Live Desk here on GB News, coming up this Tuesday afternoon. More rocket fire from Gaza and explosions too in the last hour as the uh, aerial bombardments continue. Uh, aid though arriving in the south of the Rafa border crossing. The humanitarian crisis though looks as if it's still deepening. President Biden is preparing to fly to Israel and Jordan for crisis talks tomorrow as Iran issues a chilling warning that it could take action in hours if Gaza continues to be bombed. We'll have the latest from the Brussels terror attack as French President um, Macron now says all European states are vulnerable. There's a resurgence of Islamist terrorism and we all have vulnerability that comes with democracies and the rule of law where individuals can decide to commit the worst.
We're also going to be live in Aberdeen as Scottish First Minister Humza Yousaf makes his keynote speech at the SNP's conference, promising £300 million for health in Scotland. First, here's all your latest headlines with Aaron. Good afternoon to you. It is a minute past one. Aaron Armstrong here in the GB newsroom. A British teenager who's been missing since last weekend's attacks by Hamas has been confirmed dead. 13-year-old Yahel on the right of your picture was killed when gunmen attacked her kibbutz on October 7th. Yahel was killed uh, along with her mother, Leanne. Her elder sister, Noya, and their father, Eli, are still missing. The Prime Minister, Rishi Sunak, has called for the immediate release of hostages. It's thought another nine Britons are amongst some 200 people being held by Hamas. The Israeli journalist, Yotam Konfino, says their outlook is bleak. They are in a horrendous situation, most likely kept underground in tunnels by Hamas. That's at least what Israel estimates. So this hostage situation is... Uh, it's really just another humanitarian catastrophe that uh, develops at the same time as uh, what, you know, the atrocities also we see in, in Gaza, not deliberately committed by Israel. Israel says it's not targeting civilians, but we do see these uh, ruins everywhere in Gaza. So these two situations are just simply horrific and not solved yet. Well, at least 60 people have been killed in Gaza as Israeli airstrikes continue for an 11th day. Palestinian authorities say uh, the attacks overnight took place in Yunus Khan and at the Rafah crossing in the south of the enclave, where uh, the Israeli military has told civilians to take refuge. The World Health Organization says at least 2,800 people have now been killed in Gaza, with 11,000 Injured, Israel believes 600,000 residents have left the north of the enclave ahead of an expected ground offensive. The United Nations says hospitals in Gaza are on the verge of collapse and the Rafah crossing to Egypt remains closed. Well, the US president will visit Israel tomorrow in a show of solidarity as fears grow the war in Gaza could engulf the Middle East. His visit was announced by the US Secretary of State Antony Blinken after several days of his own shuttle diplomacy in the region. Biden's expected to urge Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu to minimise civilian casualties and to establish a humanitarian corridor out of Gaza. He'll also meet Arab leaders in an effort to stop the conflict spreading. It comes after Iran pledged to take preemptive action against Israel. Egypt is also set to host a summit to discuss the conflict on Saturday. Now, the return of Islamist terrorism poses a threat to all European nations. That's according to the French president, Emmanuel Macron. His comments come after police in Brussels shot dead a gunman suspected of killing two Swedish people last night. It happened in the city centre ahead of Belgium's Euro 2024 qualifier against Sweden. The 45-year-old suspect claimed responsibility in an online video identifying himself as a member of Islamic State. Belgium's Prime Minister says terrorists cannot be allowed to succeed. Attackers want to seed fear, distrust and division in our free society. Terrorists have to understand that they will never succeed in this mission. They will never subdue our free society. With their hate and violence, they show above all their powerlessness. Terrorism. Now, a 77-year-old woman has died after being uh, hit by a bus in Manchester city centre. Uh, the vehicle crashed into a shop on Monday. Uh, the family of Almina Amaka says she was well-loved and her presence will be hugely missed. A 64-year-old man's been bailed on suspicion of causing death by dangerous driving after being arrested at the scene. Uh, Google is set to provide a new AI research centre at the University of Cambridge. Researchers are hoping the collaboration will help with the development of responsible artificial intelligence that will benefit people. The tech giant is the first funding partner for the university's centre for AI. It will include uh, robotics and human-machine interaction. Rolls-Royce is planning to cut up to 2,500 jobs worldwide. The company says it's aiming to become more streamlined and more efficient through the process. Rolls-Royce currently employs 42,000 people, with about half of those in the UK. And weather warnings are in place uh, for tomorrow uh, with the arrival of Storm Babette. It's the second named storm of the season and it will last until Saturday. The Met Office is warning of potential flooding 
power cuts and disruption as a result of wind and rain. It'll cover much of Scotland, uh, the east part of Northern Ireland and the north and east of England. This is GB News on TV, on digital radio and on your smart speaker too. Now, back to Mark and Pip. Anna, thanks very much. Just to bring you a bit of breaking news we're getting from the French Foreign Ministry that says a total of 21 French citizens have died as a result of the Hamas attacks. Uh, those details just coming through as uh, President Macron had been speaking publicly, saying all European states are vulnerable following the, the Brussels attacks. So 21 French citizens say the Foreign Ministry uh, have died as a result of the attacks so far. And news within the last hour as well. Jordan is going to host a four-party summit in Amman with President Joe Biden, whom we know is travelling there tomorrow, and Egyptian and Palestinian leaders. They will be discussing the impact of war in Gaza on the rest of the region. And an official statement said they will be looking at ways to find a political horizon that would allow the revival of the peace process. But, of course, uh, on the other stage, Iran threatening action within hours uh, if the Israeli bombardment of Gaza continues. But as we can see with the latest pictures, uh, there is more black smoke over the Gaza skyline. And we've also seen in this past hour rocket fire from Gaza into Israel. So the aerial warfare uh, continuing uh, with fresh explosions. Now, Turkey's foreign minister says he's talking to Hamas on securing the release of foreigners, civilians and children held hostage by the uh, militants in Gaza. But there has been no further reaction from Hamas about this. Then this morning in uh, the other developments, an Israeli mother of a 21-year-old uh, Mia Shem who was paraded by Hamas uh, in a, a video uh, asking the world to bring her baby back home, of course, a reminder of the human cost of all this. I didn't know she's dead or alive until yesterday. All I knew is that she might be kidnapped. Um, I'm begging the world to bring my baby back home. Hospitals in Gaza are struggling to cope with the airstrikes and the blockade as they await the expected Israeli ground offensive. GB News' Charlie Peters has this report. Every hour, more patients arrive from the front line of Israel's war on Hamas. Already strained by the casualties, the Sheba Medical Center is prepping for an imminent full-scale invasion of Gaza. This intensive care unit has had to draft in volunteers. The feeling here is that the government is not doing enough. The government doesn't really care about the people here, so we're here to support them. A lot of people are coming here and they constantly want to help. All of us are helping. Uh, we're like a giant community of helpers, like a giant army. When the war started, the Sheba Medical Center opened this brand new intensive care facility. Since then, it's been in constant use. Half of the patients are civilians, the rest are soldiers. For more than nine days, life has hung in the balance for many of the civilians brought here. Enemy! Victims of the attack by Hamas terrorists on communities in southern Israel. They are traumatized, injured and suffering horrendous burns. This family hid from Hamas in their basement shelter. Unable to find them, the terrorists set fire to their house. They survived. The youngest, a baby of just 18 months, has burns across 30% of her body. My sister uh, and my, uh, my family, uh, with a lot of braves, fight with them with the hands. They are in not good uh, condition, but we are... We are, want to say thank God about uh, that uh, they get inside and they uh, here now. But the director of the Burns unit believes that the worst is yet to come. I've never seen such a slaughter. It's not even, you know, it's, it's inhuman. I don't know how to say it. And it touches every one of us. I lost two of my... Uh, Two of my friends' kids already in battle. Uh, 
So it's hard then, you know, when I have a, a minute out of here, we go to funerals. Every Israeli knows the mission to end Hamas will not come without more pain and suffering. There will be more wounded and lives cut short in the worst violence Israel has seen for 50 years. More civilians and soldiers will be sent to this hospital, a medical facility that is preparing for a long war. Charlie Peters, GB News, Israel. Well, let's get the very latest live now with Charlie, who is uh, still in Tel Aviv there for us. And, and Charlie, a reminder, of course, of the human costs now on, on both sides. And we've got now more detail from the White House about what um, Biden might try to achieve in the coming days. Um, John Kirby, the national security spokesperson, saying... Uh, the president will make it clear we want to continue working with all our partners in the region, including Israel, to get humanitarian assistance in and provide some kind of safe pa passage for civilians to get out. So clearly the, the message on the di diplomatic front still is very much humanitarian aid. Yes, and this has been the big question of the last few days. Is it going to be possible to open the Rafa crossing and allow foreign nationals in particular to exit, but also to allow aid to enter. We have seen dozens of trucks gathering on the Egyptian side over the last 48 hours, but so far none have entered. There have been now three occasions when the Americans have expressed hope that the Rafa crossing may open. At one point they said it would open imminently, they expected, and then nothing occurred. In fact, yesterday, instead of the crossing opening, we saw some shelling landing around the gate there on the Egyptian side. We still don't know who uh, launched the point of origin of that shelling on the gate, but the uh, Hamas-affiliated radio station in southern Gaza claimed that it was launched by the IDF, who, as you can imagine, denied that accusation. But the situation in south Gaza is becoming extremely untenable for the people there. And, of course, it comes as the Israelis are asking so many people to move from the north to the south for that likely ground invasion. We have heard in the last two hours from a colonel in the IDF communications department who said that other options may be open in terms of what the IDF did next. But I don't think it's worth reading into that too much. That ground invasion does seem to be the most likely option there by some distance. And so they really urgently need people to move south. But of course, so many Gazans in the north saying that is frankly impossible. Over 600,000 have made the journey, but hundreds of thousands remain, and many of them are children in hospitals, in intensive care, or the elderly who just can't move out of that area, especially the Shifa hospital in Gaza City. So the American side there, especially meeting with the King, King Abdullah of Jordan tomorrow alongside the Egyptian president, El Sisi, they will hope to achieve some degree of humanitarian support, finally, to an area which is blockaded and running out of fuel, water and food. Something I just want to uh, ask you about, Charlie, is um, the IDF uh, has been speaking and they appear to have cast a little bit of doubt on this expected ground offensive, saying that... Uh, this is uh, Lieutenant Colonel Richard Hecht saying, we're pre preparing for the next stages of war. We have not said what that will be. Everyone is talking about the ground offensive. It might be something different. Hmm. Well, I think Colonel Hecht, I th again, I just don't think we should read too much into that statement. I think what everyone anticipates in Israel is that ground invasion. Um, attending the, the press conferences so far, they do speak quite fluidly about a range of issues, and people, are, I think, are reading in quite closely onto that comment. Um, and, of course, the military will never announce its plans so clearly just before it commits to an invasion. So I think uh, it's just a standard line there from the colonel. But there are, there are and there have been significant operations outside of just that ground build-up of that convoy on the south alongside the Gaza Strip. There have also been sea and air operations, of course, continuing on the Gaza Strip. We saw the first footage this morning of IDF warships launching rockets into the Gaza Strip. Where they struck, they claimed more of Hamas military capabilities. And we've also had reports in the last hour that the Hamas commander who controls the Rafah crossing, who is in charge of that situation from the Gazan side, has also been killed uh, by an IDF strike. But we wait for verification 
on that report, of course. In terms of the rest of the country, we are seeing more attacks in northern Israel just in the last hour, more missiles being fired onto Israeli posts. They've responded with artillery. That situation, it escalates by the hour, it seems. And also in the West Bank, the death toll there has quietly snuck up to 61. This is the mm. worst week on record since the UN began observing the area. And I think there's going to be some more serious unrest there. It's highly likely that the demonstrations of that landlocked and much more significant um, uh, territory in this area will flare up. Three million people there, many of them protesting, they say, in support of Gazans under the blockade yeah. in what could be a quite a tense and dangerous situation. And, and, of course, what uh, role the Palestinian Authority then would, would play in the future. But um, just to touch on the, the fate of the hostages and those, uh, of course, from um, outside uh, the immediate area. I mean, we've got the French Foreign Ministry now confirming 21 French nationals killed. Several French nationals likely still being held was their official line. And in this sort of video that's been released by Hamas of the French uh, teenage girl, um, they've called it vile. Just a reminder about the, the international nature uh, of this crisis. Yes, and many people, of course, urging the Israelis to do what they can to recover those hostages. That is a big part of the international dialogue here and the diplomacy taking place. Some 199 understood to be under her mass control. But of course, as the delayed approach to that likely invasion continues, this only um, this not only gives them more time to prepare their forces, but also to gather more intelligence on the latest understanding of where those hostages are. Because Hamas is sorry, Gaza is a place of two layers: the civilian layers on the top, but also some 500 kilometres of tunnels underneath. And those hostages could be anywhere underneath them. And so they need more time to develop a greater understanding of where those people might be being kept, what their state is, and whether or not it's going to be possible to extract them during any invasion. Charlie, in Tel Aviv, thank you very much indeed for updating us there with the latest. Next, we're going to be bringing you the latest from Brussels, where a man's been shot dead after killing two Swedish nationals. Our security editor will bring you right up to date. Stay with us. I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to ordinary people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels, we're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. The Live Desk with me, Mark Longhurst. And me, Pip Thompson. It's here Monday to Friday on GB News. From midday, we'll bring you the news as it breaks, whenever it's happening and wherever it's happening, from across the UK and around the world. Refreshing, feisty, but with a bit of fun too. If it matters to you, we'll have it covered on TV, radio and online. Join the Live Desk on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. So Jubes and Co, we tackle the issues of the day with real robust debate. Both sides of the fence, battling it out with me in the middle with my forthright opinions and views. And often really interesting things happen because you start with a position and then by the end of the debate, you find actually, well, I might not have thought about that one. What we need in this country is two new political parties. You should maybe think about doing a 2024 calendar. <coughs> I'm Michelle Jubry and I'm keeping you company right through until seven o'clock this evening. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's watching. Join us every night on GB News at 11pm for Headliners, which is three top comedians going through the next day's news stories, which is exactly what you need, because when the establishment has gone crazy, you need some craziness to make sense of it. Headliners, you don't have to bother reading the newspaper, we've got it covered for you. Every night at 11pm and repeated every morning at 5am. We won't send you to sleep like some of the other paper review shows out there. So join us 11pm every night on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Join me, Camilla Tomini, on Sunday mornings from 9.30, taking the politicians to task and breaking out of SW1 to see how their decisions are affecting you across the UK. Bursting the Westminster bubble every Sunday morning, only on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's watching. 
every Sunday from 11. Join Michael Portillo. There will be topical discussion, looking at the week before and the week to come. So kick back and relax at 11 a.m. on Sundays on GB News with me, Michael Portillo. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Nightmare Commute. Kick it up a gear with me, Patrick Christie's, at drive time, 3 till 6 p.m., Monday to Friday, on GB News Radio. You can listen online and on DAB+, Plus on the Smart Speaker app and on the GB News app. And if you've got an Alexa, all you have to say is, Alexa, play GB News. We're also on TuneIn and the Radio Player apps. From the school run to rush hour, get revved up with me, Patrick Christie's, on GB News and GB News Radio. Welcome back to the live desk. Let's reflect now on events in Brussels, where police have shot a man who'd killed two Swedish nationals last night. Local media there reporting that he's uh, a 45-year-old Tunisian national, Abdus Salam, and was shot at a cafe this morning. Brussels has been on its highest terror alert after yesterday's attack. In response, uh, Prime Minister Alexander de Cruz said terrorists must understand that they will never succeed in their intent. Well, let's get more with our Home and Security Editor, Mark White, joining us in the studio. As another European leader, President Macron, says uh, that all European states are vulnerable. Indeed, we're even being told that the Met is probably going to look at security ahead of the next qualifier at Wembley. Yes, they are. Scotland Yard have said that they are enhancing their security preparations and measures around that uh, match uh, against Italy. So Wembley. we will mm. uh, in w Wembley. Yeah. So we will see uh, extra police officers. Uh, what we won't see, but which will be also ramped up, are the uh, security services behind the scenes who are uh, also looking at those who may pose a potential threat, keeping an eye on those higher risk individuals as much as they can because, yeah. you know, it's not even true to say hundreds. There are thousands of people on their radar that they have to prioritise. And was it 800 uh, live 800 live investigations are, are currently at the moment mm. uh, that uh, they are involved in. They are at various levels, yeah, of yeah. course. They're not all uh, high-tempo, late-stage plot planning. Uh, it may be just individuals who have they've been brought to their attention that they're looking at, but they know uh, there are, you know, several thousand extremists in this country that could pose a potential risk to, to life. Uh, and you're on about uh, obviously mentioning there uh, President Macron, of yep. course, well, he knows mm. uh, only too well uh, what happens, uh, the devastating effects of terrorist attacks. The latest one just last week on Friday when a teacher Stop. was stabbed to death at a school in Arras in northeastern France, three others injured in what the French authorities say was a terrorist attack. What do we know about the motive potentially behind yesterday's attack? I see um, Belgium's public broadcaster is saying that prosecutors are no longer excluding a link between yesterday's attack and the ongoing conflict in Israel. They had, they didn't think it was connected before. Well, I mean, in the, the actual uh, video that this attacker put out um, just before committing this attack, he mentioned, uh, as well as being a supporter of ISIS, that it was in part revenge for the killing of a young Palestinian teenager uh, in the United States. So there's self-evidently mm. from him, that indication as well. So, yes, absolutely, they are looking at that potential possibility. And he was, he was known to police, uh, but we believe because of uh, alleged people smuggling and his asylum application had also been rejected. So you, he was on a list, in other words. He claimed asylum in 2019, and that was, as you say, 
rejected, but then he disappeared off the radar, as so many failed asylum seekers often do, uh, only to re-emerge uh, in this uh, deadly attack. Now, you're right, the authorities were uh, seeking him in connection with some people smuggling offences as well. What that, you know, how that, uh, how deeply uh, involved yeah, yeah. he was in people smuggling, we don't know, but it was something that the authorities uh, were actively looking at. Why were people from Sweden targeted? Well, there is a very significant uh, issue problems uh, within Sweden at the moment with uh, the number of asylum seekers that have arrived in that country and the integration of many of those asylum seekers and other migrants that have uh, landed in uh, Sweden itself, with many people in Sweden linking the surge in migrant numbers into that country with some very serious offences that have been committed. So that's led to a lot of tensions, claims uh, among, among the uh, Muslim community that actually, uh, you know, people in Sweden uh, are uh, Islamophobic in the way that they have been treating those uh, Muslims within their country. But if you speak to many lawmakers and citizens in Sweden, they say there is a very significant issue uh, with some very serious crimes rocketing and being linked directly to uh, migrants who have been charged yeah. uh, and uh, even imprisoned in connection with some of those particular crimes. There are, I should also say there have been incidents uh, this year of uh, the burning of uh, Quran, the Islamic mm -hmm. holy book, uh, which has inflamed uh, again the feelings uh, amongst many within the uh, Muslim world. And I, I guess the other reflection is they were an easy target in Brussels. We understand they were probably wearing the, the yellow... Uh, football kit so that they could be easily identified on the streets. Yes, absolutely. And, and after the attack itself, uh, the supporters, 700 uh, travelling support who were in the stadium were held there yeah, yeah. until 11 o'clock at night before mm. the police could be sure that uh, they have all had at that time, because the attacker hadn't been apprehended, that they had all the security in place to be able to safely escort those fans Safe passage, out of, yeah. the, out of uh, Brussels. And others who were in Belgium were uh, being asked to, if they could, take off their, their, their football tops and, you know, not uh, identify themselves as being Swedish. It's sad state of mm. affairs, but clearly they believe that they were targeted, the authorities believe they were targeted because of the nationality. A few eyebrows have been raised about the length of time it took to find him, to locate him, but you've been saying it's because he was not on foot. Uh, yeah, well, even if he was on foot, if you run off, it's possible you can get away before the police arrive and, um, you know, make good your escape in some way. The difference between this attack and quite a lot of the Islamist attacks that we see is that the perpetrators often want to be martyred uh, as part of the process of killing and then ascending to whatever glory they think, they think uh, awaits them afterwards. They deliberately want to be shot dead by the police, so they will hang about continuing to attack or just waiting yeah. to be shot by the police. And, this person ran off. And, and the key, I guess, cycled. now, will they, they'll be trying to track back and, and visiting his, uh, his electronic footprint, if you like, see who he's been in contact with. Is this a sort of lone wolf, as it's described, or has he got direct links with other people? Well, what the Belgian authorities are saying at the moment is of no evidence to say that there are, were any other people involved in this particular attack. However, they've not ruled out that there would be others who might have had knowledge mm -hmm. of what he was planning, that may even provided some material assistance, or more worrying, that may well be planning something similar for, for the themselves. So all that mm -hmm. has to be sort of gone into and bottomed out, and that's why we're seeing today uh, raids and searches mm. of properties in the Brussels area linked to this man, uh, his family and his friends. Yeah. OK, Mark, thank you very much indeed for that. More, of course, as we get it, uh, and, and particularly on the Met and what they're saying about Wembley as well, of course. Thanks very much indeed. It is fast coming up to 1.30. Uh, we'll be bringing you the latest from a press conference in London in which the Palestinian ambassador has been speaking, saying that uh, this is not a war on Hamas, but the people on Palestine. First, though, let's get your latest headlines with Aaron.
It's half past one. I'm Aaron Armstrong in the GB Newsroom. A British teenager who's been missing since last weekend's attacks by Hamas has been confirmed dead. 13-year-old Yahel, on the right of your picture, was killed when gunmen attacked her kibbutz on the 7th of October. Yahel was killed along with her mother, Leanne, while her elder sister, Noya, and their father, Eli, are still missing. The Prime Minister has called for the immediate release of hostages. It's thought another nine Britons are amongst some 200 people being held by Hamas. Meanwhile, the US president will visit Israel tomorrow in a show of solidarity as fears grow that the war in Gaza could engulf the Middle East. His visit was announced by the US Secretary of State, Antony Blinken, after several days of diplomacy in the region. Biden is expected to urge the Prime Minister, Benjamin Netanyahu, to minimise civilian casualties and to establish a humanitarian corridor out of Gaza. He's also scheduled to meet Arab leaders in an effort to stop the conflict from spreading. Uh, last night, Iran pledged to take preemptive action against Israel in the coming hours. The return of uh, Islamist terrorism poses a threat to all European nations. That's according to the French President Emmanuel Macron. His comments come a day after two Swedish people were shot and killed in a terror attack in Brussels. Belgian police say the suspect, who identified himself as a supporter of Islamic State, were shot and, he was shot and killed this morning. It happened in the city centre before Belgium's Euro 2020 qualif 2024 qualifier against Sweden. Food supplies have been brought back on board the Bibby Stockholm barge ahead of the arrival of, of asylum seekers uh, later this week. Now, 39 people were briefly accommodated on the barge, uh, but it was then evacuated in August following the discovery of Legionella disease in the water supply. The Home Office say the tests have all been completed, though, and it plans to send asylum seekers back there this week. I'll be back with more at the top of the next hour, or you can get more now on our website, gbnews.com. For a valuable legacy your family can own, gold coins will always shine bright. Rosalind Gold proudly sponsors the GB News Financial Report. Quick snapshot of the markets today. The pound will buy you $1.2174 and €1 €1.1516. The price of gold is £1,582.30 per ounce and the FTSE 100 is at 7,665 points. Rosalind Gold proudly sponsors the GB News Financial Report. Who is it? We're here for the show. Welcome to the Dinosaur Hour. I was uh, married to a therapist. And you survived? I thought we were getting Hugh Laurie. Second best. <laughs> you interviewed Saddam Hussein. What's that like? I was terrified. I'm playing strip poker with these three. Oh! No, thank you. <laughs> My CDs need to be put in alphabetical order. Ah. Uh, Are you going to be problematic again? <laughs> the Dinosaur Hour. Sunday, the 29th of October at 9 on GB News. What you get for breakfast is something that, if we do our jobs right, you will wake up to news that you didn't know the night before. It's a conversation. It's not just me and Eamon. We want to get to know you, and we want you to get to know us. From 6, it's Breakfast with Eamon and Isabel. Monday to Thursdays on GB News. Britain's news channel. People in Britain, they love free speech, but they also love fair play. I don't care if I'm speaking somebody from a trade union, from the Labour Party, somebody from the SNP. And I think the viewers like to see that actually we can challenge one another, but in a positive way. We think we ask the questions that people want to ask, and often we ask the questions that we wanted to ask in Parliament but never got the chance to ask. So join us every Saturday, 10am till noon on GB News. Britain's news channel. Nightmare Commute. Kick it up a gear with me, Patrick Christie's, at drive time, 3 till 6 p.m., Monday to Friday, on GB News Radio. You can listen online and on DAB+, Plus on the Smart Speaker app and on the GB News app. And if you've got an Alexa, all you have to say is, Alexa, play GB News. We're also on TuneIn and the Radio Player apps. From the school run to rush hour, get revved up with me, Patrick Christie's, on GB News and GB News Radio. Westminster is going around in ever-decreasing circles, followed by the media. Britain is broken. How on earth did we get into this mess? But more importantly, how do we 
get out of it. Join me at 7 p.m. Monday to Thursdays on Farage here on GB News. We will have open, rational debate. We've got to work out how Britain moves forward from this. Join us here on GB News, the people's channel. Britain is watching. Join me, Andrew Pearce and Bev Turner, Monday to Thursday, 9.30 a.m. Who benefits from that? Not the British public. And on Fridays, join us, Tom Harwood and Ellie Costello from Britain's Newsroom. That's what you get with this show, that's fantastic. If it's happening, we're talking about it on Britain's Newsroom. GB News, Britain's news channel. GB News, unlike other broadcasters, isn't obsessed with the London Westminster bubble. We think there's a nation beyond the M25, and that's why we talk about the issues that matter across the land. Join me on State of the Nation, 8 to 9 o'clock, Monday to Thursday, on GB News. Daisy's listening, and you should too. Now then, Lee Anderson here. Join me on GB News on my show, The Real World, every Friday at 7 p.m. I'm not eating bloody cat. Are you Delicious. Mental? Open your mouth. OK, here comes, a, here comes a train. Reminds me of the scene in Singing in the Rain. Adam, is that a good one? Whoa! Whoa! Join me at 7 on GB News, Britain's news channel. Welcome back to the live desk. Now, the Palestinian ambassador to London, Hussam Zomlat, has been holding a news conference in London this morning in which he said that uh, there was a humanitarian uh, crisis, immediate ceasefire needed with the setting up of the humanitarian corridor, indicating that uh, casualties included at least 1,000 children with 50 families, he said, completely wiped out. Yeah, he was speaking as uh, medical staff in Gaza warned that thousands of people could die as hospitals run so dangerously low on just the basic supplies uh, ahead of uh, that expected uh, Israeli ground offensive. Well, our reporter Theo Chikomba was at that press conference and we can hear from him now. Uh, Theo, give us, give us the, the main lines then here. What exactly did he say? Yes, well, the UK's uh, Palestinian ambassador was direct in his speech here uh, during the press conference, which lasted just over an hour. And he was clear that he wanted to make that distinction that he's seen uh, in the coverage in the last couple of weeks about uh, the Hamas group and Palestinians. He was saying civilians are the ones who are bearing the brunt of this. As you mentioned, the number, a 1,000 uh, children, he said, have died, and that five um, every five minutes, Palestinians are getting killed and he said this is collective punishment and he said there needs to be an urgent uh, ceasefire when it comes to the ongoing situations. He himself says he's been in touch with the UK government every single day uh, working alongside our diplomats um, over the last couple of weeks and indeed we did see the King of Jordan uh, in the UK this week meeting uh, with uh, the Prime Minister and we did hear many other things he said he's hoping uh, he's able to achieve by having some of those uh, conversations which he's having every single day. We can uh, bring some of what he said to you um, from this morning. Infrastructure, schools, medical centers, homes, markets, and the prevention of the supply of water, food, fuel, electricity, and medicine from reaching Gaza have already taken a terrible toll. Official numbers this morning find more than 2,850 Palestinians killed in Gaza and the West Bank. Palestinians being targeted as they try to leave their homes towards the south of Gaza. There are hundreds, hundreds if not thousands, buried as we speak under rubble. Well, Theo, as well as the details, uh, he was addressing the, the bigger picture with this sort of sobering uh, assessment, asked uh, how high is the risk of escalation in the Middle East? Nine out of ten, I gather, he said. He did indeed, and when it comes to that wider picture, he spoke about uh, the potential impact of Iran getting involved, uh, the U.S. Um, also getting involved as well. We know some of those uh, convoys uh, in the Mediterranean. Um, this is an issue which he says he doesn't want to reach to that point uh, in terms of 
escalation and he said he's worried about the spread uh, and if this will have an even further impact on the civilians as we've already seen in the last 10 days or so but this is a situation which he says is something uh, is not just from the last 10 days this is something that's affected uh, Palestinians uh, for a very long time uh, decades he said and he's hoping that there is a resolution with an immediate ceasefire in the near future Thank you very much for updating us, uh, Theo, that, uh, that news conference held in London by the ambassador a little earlier. Now, Scottish First Minister Humza Yousaf is to pledge an extra £300 million for the NHS in Scotland over the next three years. Cash that could apparently reduce waiting lists by 100,000 by 2026. Well, he's expected to announce uh, this funding in a keynote speech at the annual conference in Aberdeen this afternoon, but also using the speech to insist that support for independence could be increased to a sustained majority. Of course, SNP support slipping in the polls and, uh, well, a... a Significant defeat, of course, at the Rutherglen by-election. Let's get more with our Scotland reporter, Tony Maguire, who's in Aberdeen. Um, Tony, it's his first uh, conference in charge, and, um, well, he's he got a lot on his plate. Yeah, you could say that, couldn't you? Um, I think if it wasn't everything going on here at the conference, he would still have a lot on his plate, um, certainly with um, those personal ties with, with family over in Gaza just now. Now, this is, as you said, his inaugural conference. In fact, delegates here um, haven't had anyone other than Nicola Sturgeon for the last nine years. So this will have a, a very fresh feel for delegates who come to the, the conference year after year. Um, and certainly it was at the conference last year where Nicola Sturgeon told delegates less than 90 seconds into her closing speech that um, if the courts found in the favour of the SNP last year, then we would be having a Scottish independence referendum Thursday. This Thursday, as in the day after tomorrow. But of course, now we know that the courts f fell on the side of Westminster. And really, the independence question has been up in the air for the last 12 months or so, not to mention everything else going on with the SNP at the start of this year. So back to the drawing board, Hamza Youssef and Westminster leader Stephen Flynn, who's an MP up in this neck of the woods in the northeast in Aberdeenshire, he, they came together to form an idea that at the next general election, a majority of Scottish seats for the SNP would therefore be enough to open negotiations with Westminster about the possibilities of a new independence referendum. And if Westminster fails to hear them, then the Scottish election in 2026, well, that would then be a, back to a de facto referendum. So it kind of still leaves more questions. How is this plan really any different? And also, what does it matter if Conservatives and Labour are both staunch in their opinions that they won't yield to allow another referendum for this generation? And of course, yesterday there was a, a standing ovation for Nicola Sturgeon as she entered the arena um, and delegates were treated to a, a showreel of, of her best bits, perhaps a precursor for her entering the Big Brother house next year, but unlikely if she's got that book to write, of course. And then Chris, Chris Hoy, sorry, Craig Hoy, who's the Scottish Conservative chairman, you know, he's pointed out that Nicola Sturgeon's appearance yesterday has perhaps upstaged um, the, the First Minister. Now, as she came down that glass staircase yesterday and she spoke to um, the press, you know, she was asked about how Hamza Youssef is, is doing as First Minister, um, and this is what she had to say. The party is doing what the party needs to do is remember and remind people why we've won so many elections in the past eh, almost 20 years now. It's about being on the side of people eh, who aspire eh, for a better life for themselves and their kids. It's about standing up and providing a voice for people who are often marginalised. This is a, a very different conference experience for me than eh, the ones that I've been used to. But I've been watching from afar eh, over the course of yesterday, I think, comes a um, you know that I think Hans is doing a fantastic job as leader of the party and as first minister, and I don't think there's any doubt from what I've seen about who is in charge of this party. 
Well, certainly at 3.15 today, Hamza Yusuf will have his opportunity to step out from her shadow and finally become Hamza Yusuf First Minister with his own ideas and not Hamza Yusuf continuity candidate. Tony, thanks very much. Uh, we want to take viewers and listeners uh, straight to the Palace of Versailles in France uh, because it is being evacuated for a security scare. The second time in four days that one of France's most visited tourist attractions has had to close. Now, France is on heightened alert against uh, potential attacks after that fatal stabbing of a school teacher last week. President Macron has said only today that all European states are v vulnerable. There is a resurgence of Islamist terrorism. Yeah, we're told it is a bomb alert and that the bomb squad are on the way or, or maybe already on site. Uh, but as we were saying, evacuation took place at the weekend, of course, after the uh, deadly knife attack on a teacher in northern France. So clearly um, heightened state of alert. Um, indications uh, that uh, they are trying to uh, assess the very, well, uh, complicated uh, ground uh, uh, area of Versailles uh, bit by bit to establish uh, that it is safe. But as we were seeing with those pictures, people have been moved out and are outside uh, the main building. I think we can bring you uh, more of those pictures uh, as they're coming in. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll bring those uh, as soon as we can. But also we have President Macron, of course, who's been speaking elsewhere, uh, saying that the whole of uh, Europe, uh, as he said, um, is vulnerable at the moment. Uh, European states are vulnerable uh, following that attack in Brussels. More, of course, as we get it from Paris. The Prime Minister has confirmed that at least six Britons have died and another nine are missing following the assault by Hamas on southern Israel. One 13-year-old girl has been killed and more remain missing after Hamas terrorists attacked their kibbutz. This comes as Downing Street has urged Israel to allow water into Gaza while refusing uh, to say whether the tactic to shut off the supply is in line with international law. Let's get more with our political editor, uh, Chris Hope, who's at Westminster for or at Downing Street for us. Uh, and, Chris, it's a pretty pointed comment, we understand, from the Prime Minister's spokesman, specifically on this humanitarian aspect of the water supplies. And that's right, no comment there. They're saying they're supporting Israel's right to defend herself, to try and really get these uh, hostages and people held by Hamas in Gaza released. But yes, nothing further on that. They're treading a very delicate line here, aren't they, the UK government? In that, in that same uh, meeting there, the cabinet meeting that started at half past nine, ran till 11 in the building behind me, um, the PM, Rishi Sunak, for the first time, did talk about the issue of adopted, suspected ad abduction of British nationals in Gaza. Now, that's the first time he's used that term. Uh, um, the idea of hostages has been around for a bit, but the first time the UK government has used that, it wasn't used yesterday, for example, by the PM when he addressed MPs in the House of Commons. Um, now, elsewhere in Westminster today, we've had visits here from th uh, Israelis with families missing in Gaza. We've had a visit from Limor Sela Broida, um, Roit Maho and Nurit Retta and Shani Segal. Now, they met earlier with the, with, uh, the Labour leadership, that's Sir Keir Starmer, David Lamy, the shadow, shadow Foreign Secretary, Angela Rayner, the Deputy Leader, and Lisa Nandy, the Shadow Development Secretary. And earlier, I caught up with what they had to say outside Parliament. Ten family members from Kibbutz Berry and two family members from Kibbutz Nahal Oz that were taken Saturday morning. We have no recollection of anything. We don't have um, any news of their whereabouts or state that they're in. We don't know if they're dead or alive, if they're wounded. We don't know if they're dry or fed, if they got their medicine. Um, we have um, three children, eight years old, three year old, a 12 year old and a teenager, 17. She's supposed to celebrate her 18th birthday on the 24th of this month and we don't know where they are. We don't know anything about them. She was texting to the family, her daughter was talking to her. Her daughter said that there were noises in the last half an hour she was there, and then the contact uh, disconnected. We couldn't text her anymore, and there was nothing, nothing from her till Monday morning when they allocated the mobile. But I was, my sister, we don't know if she's... We don't even know if she's alive. We don't know if she's, she's hurt, alive. If she, she you know, she's nothing, getting taken, or neither taken care of. She's being fed. If she's warm, 
Nothing. Nothing. 8.30 in the morning on a Saturday, October 7th. That was the last time that we heard from my cousin. A few hours later, um, the army were in control of the kibbutz, and then they found their house covered with bullets, blood, and they were gone. Such a torrid, torrid time for them. Um, a British teenager has been confirmed as among those murdered by Hamas during its terrorist attack. Yahal Sharibi, 13 years old, killed along with her mother, Leanne, while her elder sister, Noya, who's 16, and her father, Eli, are still missing. And indeed, we had uh, the announcement from Turkey's foreign minister earlier today that they were in uh, direct communication with Hamas to try and uh, secure the release of all the hostages, but no uh, reaction officially yet from Hamas. We'll update you as we get more on that. And just to tell you, of course, what Downing Street was saying about the humanitarian aspect, Rishi Sunak spokesman earlier saying water was a key issue in UK efforts to, quote, relieve the unfolding humanitarian issues facing the Palestinians. Talks ongoing with Israel, he said, as the UK was keen to see water restored with fuel, food and medicine also being prevented from entering the territory. More, of course, as we get it. A memorial service has been held for the former Conservative Chancellor Nigel Lawson, who served in Margaret Thatcher's government. He died at his home in Eastbourne in April. Well, our business and economics editor Liam Halligan was uh, at this Thanksgiving service uh, today, Liam. And um, I guess the emphasis is on the thanks because clearly uh, the assessment of his position in Margaret Thatcher's government is that he was, well, in her terms, unassailable. Good to be with you, Mark and Pip. St Margaret's Church is behind me. It's a beautiful church sat right next door to Westminster Abbey. The House of Commons, the House of Lords is just to my right. We're in the heart of Westminster. And this was really an apt place for this memorial to Nigel Lawson, who died aged 91, as you said earlier this year. He was an early entrant into Margaret Thatcher's cabinet in 1981. He was very much a sort of intellectual soulmate with the former Prime Minister. Many people think that Nigel Lawson, who died as Lord Lawson of Blaby in Leicestershire, Blaby was his parliamentary constituency, was the most influential Chancellor of Britain's post-war period. He he and Margaret Thatcher famously fell out over Europe. Uh, I think his resignation really lit the touch paper on the end of uh, to end her premiership, along with another formula chancellor, Geoffrey Howe. But a huge gathering here, not just of the Tory faithful of years gone by, but also lots of journalists, uh, people involved in public life. I've got the memorial paper here, a service of remembrance for the life and work of the Right Honourable, the Lord Lawson of Blaby, 19. 32 to 2023. One of the real giants of conservative politics whose the memorial service was held here today and many people were saying in the fringes after the speeches by the likes of Prime Minister Rishi Sunak, former Chancellor Lord uh, uh, Norman Lamont, the Archbishop of Canterbury of course, Justin Welby, but many people were saying in the fringes of the memorial service and at the drinks afterwards, God, I wish Nigel Lawson was around now because we need some of his policies. And in terms of uh, the way ahead, of course, we've got some uh, figures today in terms of uh, the oil price, you know, that the geopolitical situation is becoming, well, pretty sort of uh, febrile, isn't it? It certainly is. That's how I got to know Nigel Lawson as, as a young journalist back in the 90s. Uh, we often talked about oil markets. He followed commodity prices very, yeah, very closely. Yeah. But what he was known for, really, Mark and Pip, was tax cutting. He took the corporation tax rate in the UK from 52 per cent, an eye watering 52 per cent in 1983 when he entered office, all the way down to 30 per cent. And he took the top rate of tax famously from 60 to 40 per leading to that famous Sun headline after that budget, nice one, Nigel. And I know because I conducted the very last interview with him that he was looking at the geopolitical situation. It was after the start of the war in Ukraine. It was just a, f a couple of days before he died, actually, that I spoke to him in March 2023. He was mindful of the geopolitics. He was mindful also, in his view, of the need for the Conservative Party to be a tax-cutting party, a party of the small state. Nigel Lawson really was the flag bearer for Conservatives and others of that small state disposition. And I think many people here in Westminster and across the country will be feeling his loss.
Liam, at uh, St Mary's there in Westminster, thank you very much indeed for that. Uh, marking, of course, one of the giants of uh, British politics um, in the 20th century. Uh, Brent crude, around about $90 a barrel, but, of course, the fears it could uh, head ever higher uh, with those um, various uh, announcements or warnings, perhaps, from Iran that it might take direct action. Uh, please do stay with us here on the live desk. There's lots more to come. We'll be bringing you um, the latest from France, where the Palace of Versailles, one of France's most visited tourist attractions, well, that's been evacuated uh, because of a bomb threat, the second time in four days that the palace has had to close. And President Macron has said earlier that all European states are vulnerable to terrorism and there is a resurgence of Islamist terrorism. Latest live two from Gaza, more rocket fire, but diplomacy on the way. Biden travelling there tomorrow. Latest coming up for you. I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to ordinary people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels. We're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. The Live Desk with me, Mark Longhurst. And me, Pip Thompson. It's here Monday to Friday on GB News. From midday, we'll bring you the news as it breaks, whenever it's happening and wherever it's happening, from across the UK and around the world. Refreshing, feisty, but with a bit of fun too. If it matters to you, we'll have it covered on TV, radio and online. Join the Live Desk on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. So Jubes and Co, we tackle the issues of the day with real robust debate. Both sides of the fence, battling it out with me in the middle with my forthright opinions and views. And often really interesting things happen because you start with a position and then by the end of the debate, you find actually, well, I might not have thought about that one. What we need in this country is two new political parties. You should maybe think about doing a 2024 calendar. <coughs> I'm Michelle Jubry and I'm keeping you company right through until seven o'clock this evening. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's watching. Join us every night on GB News at 11pm for Headliners, which is three top comedians going through the next day's news stories, which is exactly what you need, because when the establishment has gone crazy, you need some craziness to make sense of it. Headliners, you don't have to bother reading the newspaper, we've got it covered for you. Every night at 11pm and repeated every morning at 5am. We won't send you to sleep like some of the other paper review shows out there. So join us 11pm every night on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Join me, Camilla Tomney, on Sunday mornings from 9.30, taking the politicians to task and breaking out of SW1 to see how their decisions are affecting you across the UK. Bursting the Westminster bubble every Sunday morning, only on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's watching. Every Sunday from 11, join Michael Portillo. There will be topical discussion, looking at the week before and the week to come. So kick back and relax at 11 a.m. on Sundays on GB News with me, Michael Portillo. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Nightmare Commute. Kick it up a gear with me, Patrick Christie's, at drive time, 3 till 6 p.m., Monday to Friday, on GB News Radio. You can listen online and on DAB+, Plus on the Smart Speaker app and on the GB News app. And if you've got an Alexa, all you have to say is, Alexa, play GB News. We're also on TuneIn and the Radio Player apps. From the school run to rush hour, get revved up with me, Patrick Christie's, on GB News and GB News Radio. Good afternoon, this is the Live Desk here on GB News. Coming up for you today. Fresh explosions, more rocket fire across Gaza and Israel in the last hour. And aid arriving at the Rafa border crossing in the south, but the humanitarian crisis is deepening as Downing Street says, turn the water back on. 
This drone footage shows the devastation caused by the attacks in Gaza, people desperately looking for survivors amongst the rubble. It comes as President Biden prepares to fly to Israel for crisis talks tomorrow. We'll have the latest, too, from Brussels after the terror alert uh, put at its highest level after police shot dead a gunman who'd killed two Swedish nationals in the city. And the Palace of Versailles in Paris is evacuated due to a suspected bomb threat, according uh, to reports, as President Macron warns that all European states are vulnerable. We'll bring you the very latest on that and more. First, let's get your headlines with Aaron. Very good afternoon to you. It's two o'clock. I'm Aaron Armstrong in the GB Newsroom. A British teenager who's been missing since last weekend's attacks by Hamas has been confirmed dead. 13-year-old Yahel on the right of the picture was killed when gunmen attacked her kibbutz on the 7th of October. <laughs> Yahel was killed along with her mother Leanne, while her elder sister Noya and their father Eli are still missing. The Prime Minister's called for the immediate release of hostages. It's thought another nine Britons are among some 200 people being held by Hamas. The Israeli journalist Yotam Konfino says the outlook is bleak. They are in a horrendous situation, most likely kept underground in tunnels by Hamas. That's at least what Israel estimates. So this hostage situation is, uh, it's really just another humanitarian catastrophe that uh, develops at the same time as uh, what, you know, the atrocities also we see in, in Gaza, not deliberately committed by Israel. Israel says it's not targeting civilians, but we do see these uh, ruins everywhere in Gaza. So these two situations are just simply horrific and not solved yet. Now, aid agencies are warning of a deepening humanitarian catastrophe in Gaza amid fears the conflict will spread elsewhere in the Middle East. The Palestinian authorities claim 80 people have been uh, killed by Israeli airstrikes in South Gaza, where the Israeli military told civilians to take refuge. Hundreds of thousands have gathered there near the Rafah crossing, which remains closed. The UN believes Israel's siege of Gaza and its evacuation order could be in breach of international law and has warned all hospitals there will run out of fuel within 24 hours. The World Health Organization says at least 2,800 people have been killed in Gaza. The US President Joe Biden is visiting Israel tomorrow before attending a summit of Arab leaders in Jordan in an effort to stop the conflict from spreading. It comes after Iran pledged to take preemptive action against Israel in the coming hours. The return of Islamist terrorism poses a threat to all European nations. That's according to the French President Emmanuel Macron. His comments come a day after two Swedish people were shot and killed in a terror attack in Brussels. A Belgian police say the suspect, who identified himself as a member of Islamic State, was shot and killed this morning. Um, Swedish people uh, were held inside the stadium last night. The attack happened in the city centre before Belgium's Euro 2024 qualifier against uh, Sweden. Belgium's Prime Minister Alexander de Croo says terrorists cannot be allowed to succeed. Attackers want to seed fear, distrust and division in our free society. Terrorists have to understand that they will never succeed in this mission. They will never subdue our free society. With their hate and violence, they show above all their powerlessness. Terrorism will never beat us. And coming shortly after that warning from President Macron, the Palace of Versailles in France is evacuating its visitors this afternoon amid reports the bomb squad is on the way. It's after a teacher was killed in an Islamist attack at a school uh, last week. The country has been on high alert with the evacuation of the Louvre and also the Gare de Nord station in Paris. Greta Thunberg has been arrested after protesting against oil and gas companies in central London. Thunberg has this year been detained by police and removed from protests in Sweden, Norway and Germany. A video footage showed Thunberg wearing a badge with the slogan Oily Money Out, standing calmly as two police officers spoke to her. One then was seen holding her arm. A man will appear in court today after murdering a 70-year-old in Hartlepool. Terence Carney was using a cash machine when he was attacked in the town centre on Saturday morning. Another man remains in hospital with non-life-threatening injuries.
after being attacked at a property on Wharton Terrace. 44-year-old Ahmed Alid has been charged with murder and the attempted murder of another man. A 77-year-old woman died after being hit by a bus in Manchester city centre. Now, the family of Almina Amica said she was well-loved and her presence was hugely missed. It happened when the bus crashed into a shop on Monday. A 64-year-old man has been bailed on suspicion of causing death by dangerous driving after being arrested at the scene. Yellow weather warnings for wind and rain will be in place from tomorrow with the arrival of Storm Babette. It's expected to last until Saturday. The Met Office is warning of potential flooding, power cuts and travel disruption. The weather warning will cover Scotland, the eastern part of Northern Ireland and the north and east of England. This is GB News on TV, on digital radio and on your smart speaker too. That's it for the moment. Now back to Mark and Pip. Welcome back. You are with The Live Desk. Jordan will host a four-party summit in Amman with President Joe Biden and Egyptian and Palestinian leaders tomorrow. They'll be discussing the impact of the war in Gaza on the rest of the region and hope to make progress towards a political resolution. Well, in Gaza itself, uh, people have been uh, trying to remove debris in search for their families in the rubble of destroyed residential buildings. Uh, the latest estimate from the Palestinian uh, Health Authority is that 2,778 have been killed, 9,700 wounded, while the Israelis say that 1,400 uh, of uh, their people have also been killed. Well, the airstrikes have been continuing. Uh, Israel, of course, has vowed to annihilate, as it uh, said, Hamas. Charlie Peters has the latest for us from Tel Aviv. Every hour, more patients arrive from the front line of Israel's war on Hamas. Already strained by the casualties, the Sheba Medical Center is prepping for an imminent full-scale invasion of Gaza. This intensive care unit has had to draft in volunteers. The feeling here is that the government is not doing enough. The government doesn't really care about the people here, so we're here to support them. A lot of people are coming here and they constantly want to help. All of us are helping. Uh, we're like a giant community of helpers, like a giant army. When the war started, the Sheba Medical Center opened this brand new intensive care facility. Since then, it's been in constant use. Half of the patients are civilians, the rest are soldiers. For more than nine days, life has hung in the balance for many of the civilians brought here. Enemy! Victims of the attack by Hamas terrorists on communities in southern Israel. They are traumatized, injured and suffering horrendous burns. This family hid from Hamas in their basement shelter. Unable to find them, the terrorists set fire to their house. They survived. The youngest, a baby of just 18 months, has burns across 30% of her body. My sister uh, and my, uh, uh, my family, uh, with a lot of braves, fight with them with the hands. They are in not good uh, condition, but we, are, we are want to say thank God about uh, that uh, they get inside and they are uh, here now. But the director of the Burns unit believes that the worst is yet to come. I've never seen such a slaughter. It's not even, you know, it's... It's inhuman, I don't know how to say it, and it touches every one of us. I lost two of my uh, two of my friends' kids already in battle. Uh, so it's hard then, you know, when I have a, a minute out of here, we go to funerals. Every Israeli knows the mission to end Hamas will not come without more pain and suffering. There will be more wounded and lives cut short in the worst violence Israel has seen for 50 years. More civilians and soldiers will be sent to this hospital, a medical facility that is preparing for a long war. Charlie Peters, GB News, Israel. Well, more live now with Charlie in Tel Aviv. And Charlie, a reminder there, of course, of the growing uh, human cost of, of this and an indication with President Biden uh, arriving tomorrow for more diplomacy, it seems. 
humanitarian questions top of the list. That's right. The humanitarian situation in the south of the Gaza Strip is leading the diplomacy in the region, particularly between the Americans and the Egyptians, as they seek to find an opportunity to open the Rafah crossing to allow humanitarian aid in and allow foreign nationals gathering on that border, many of them told to head there by the Israelis, to exit from that battle zone. But there is also significant diplomacy to be done in the coming days in the north. In the last 10 minutes, we've heard from the Lebanese foreign minister who says that the situation there risks igniting. And this comes soon after also an Israeli minister said that they will hold Lebanon responsible for what Lebanese Hezbollah does in the south of the country. Obviously, Lebanon, a country that's been in crisis for several years, particularly after the Beirut port explosion of August 2020 that generated a humanitarian crisis of its own and also a political impasse. It's a very divided country where Lebanese Hezbollah operates with great freedom, much greater freedom than Hamas does in the Gaza Strip. It has significantly more munitions and has a military budget expected to be within the hundreds of millions. And so that risk there from the north is growing. And and there are more warnings from Israeli ministers about the kind of reaction they might expect if the skirmish grows on the northern border. At the same time, the Iranian foreign minister last night issued a warning about preemptive strikes and also issued further warnings this morning about what might happen to the northern region and indeed the rest of Israel if Yoav Gallant, the defence minister, continues to commit his forces into the Gaza Strip. So very much an escalating situation there where diplomacy will be deployed not just to the humanitarian situation but also that growing second front in the north. And just on that humanitarian situation, Charlie, um, people have been told, um, Palestinians, for a few days now to head south uh, from Gaza City, head south towards that Rafa crossing. But we're getting more and more reports about Israeli airstrikes in the south. And now families, we can, we can see on the, the map now exactly where that Rafa crossing is, but now families have headed south, they're going back north to Gaza City because of the bombings. And they're saying, we're just not safe anywhere. We may as well go back home. Yes, and the Israeli side are adamant that they are striking Hamas military capabilities. They are releasing footage every morning of what they claim are targets designated and occupied by Hamas fighters yeah. or munitions or indeed banks that they use to, to funnel their funds in. But of course, people on the ground are saying something quite different. Some 49 people killed in Yunus Khan this morning, according to local officials there. And many people saying, why should we flee south if there is going to be more bombing in the south? Humanitarian safe zones are something that US Secretary of State Antony Blinken has called for and that will be urgently needed to establish if the Israelis are to facilitate further travels south from that civilian population in the north. They need them to move if they are going to launch that ground invasion into Gaza City. Charlie, we understand that Israel's national security adviser, uh, Shaki Hanabi, is about to hold a news briefing to update reporters. Um, it does follow this um, rather intriguing comment from the IDF earlier that there might not necessarily be a ground offensive as, as we understand it. How is that being interpreted there in Tel Aviv? Uh, presumably there might be some military action, but not you know, something of shock and awe that we've seen traditionally. Well, you have Gallant, the defence minister, in the last few hours met with Israeli Air Force officers and support staff and very much reaffirmed that it was their mission to give an address to every bomb and make sure that address is on Hamas. So it's clear that the air, sea and land operation on the Gaza Strip will continue. But as with all militaries, they are not revealing what their next phase will be. But there have been significant hits from all senior members of the government about the mission, what is coming next, the next phase of this war, and indeed preparing for the continuation of a lengthy engagement in the Gaza Strip. One, off one offhand comment by a colonel in the IDF spokesman department is being, I think, received more intensely away from Tel Aviv than it is here, where mm, people are mm. still anticipating that likely ground invasion. Charlie, in Tel Aviv, thank you very much indeed uh, for updating us there. And, of course, we will bring you uh, anything from that national security briefing as it comes through. We're now going to talk to Ite Raviv. Four of his family members have been abducted by Hamas, including his nine-year-old cousin. 
Good afternoon to you, Itai. Thank you so much for, for joining us this afternoon on, on GB News during this horrific time for you. Just tell us, first of all, who your family members are and the, the hope that you are currently holding on to and what must be keeping you going here. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you very much for having me. So, four family members uh, have been abducted by Hamas. They live in Kibbutz near Oz. It's a small village right across uh, the border of Gaza. My uncle and aunt both are old, 78-year-old people. Uh, Avram, my uncle, uh, he can barely walk. He uses a cane uh, to walk. He needs to take medicine. Uh, they used to live there with their son, Rui, who was murdered on Saturday morning. And it's important to say murdered and not killed because he was murdered. Um, his sister, along with her son and her nine-year-old son, uh, came to visit for the weekend. And they both have been abducted as well. Ohad, uh, the grandson, is almost nine years old. He's going to celebrate, not celebrate, his birthday next week. And we really want him to celebrate it at home. And the world needs to know that, and the world needs to help and do everything in their power to release them, because they're civilians. I hear you talking all the time about civilians in Gaza, how they need humanitarian aid, and I agree mm. with you completely. But we must not forget that there are Israeli civilians inside of Gaza, in the hands of Hamas, which is a terrorist organization that is similar to ISIS and to Al-Qaeda, and we've seen the horrors and what they're capable of. We need to do everything in our power, everyone who sees that, to press on whoever, political leaders, on the press, to release the civilians. When we talk about uh, humanitarian aid, we must also talk about releasing civilians from a terror organization. We, we learnt uh, this morning, you say, that uh, the Turkish Foreign Minister had, uh, Hakan Fizan had been in talks uh, in Beirut with Ismail Haniyeh, the Hamas leader, um, specifically on the release of what he said were foreigners, civilians and children being held hostage. Is it your uh, understanding that maybe it's going to take an outside agency, if like a, a, another international country, to try and broker this? Yeah, I think that's the way things work. Yeah, that's how we've seen it in the past when we had a soldier over there. But now we're talking about civilians. And of course, civilians with foreign uh, nationality, yeah, yeah. obviously. But also civilians without foreign nationality. Why does it matter? They're civilians. If we talk about war crimes and crimes against humanity, you should never, never touch civilians. And it doesn't, their nationality doesn't matter. As long as they're civilians, mm. they should not be in captivity. Did you see the video that the terrorist group released of the, the young hostage? Could you bring yourself to watch it? And what on earth did you think? Yes. On the one hand, you obviously know that there are hostages that are alive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so How do you interpret it myself... when you see that? I brought myself to watch it. Obviously, it's a psychological uh, warfare of Hamas against Israelis, against the West, against the world. Uh, they try to present themselves as humanitarian and how they take care of people. But if they actually took care of those in captive, they wouldn't have shot them. This girl, sorry, not girl, this woman who was talking mm. shouldn't have have to be wounded, to, uh, sorry, to, to be uh, with uh, bandages on, mm. if they hadn't infiltrated into Israel and carried out a terror attack, shooting with, without stopping everyone and hitting hair amongst thousands of other people, including kids, babies, elderly. We have to remember that this is a terror organization. Everything they do, we cannot trust them, we cannot believe them. I hope the woman in the video will return home safely. Uh, she seems terrified. It seems like somebody maybe is threatening her to say what she was saying. Um, and also, according to the New York Times, I saw that this video apparently was uh, filmed a few days ago. So we don't even know her current situation, mm. what Absolutely. she is right now. 
Now, we, we've got President Biden uh, arriving there tomorrow. He's going to Tel Aviv first. Then he's going to Amman. He'll meet leaders of Israel, Jordan, Egypt, and the Palestinian leadership as well. Um, humanitarian aid seems to be at top of the list. Would you say they've got to start thinking, perhaps, about these individuals, 199, that they should be at the top of the list? Yes, of course. Like I told you before, when you talk about humanitarian aid, mm. this is within humanitarian aid. I don't know if Hamas is uh, cooperating with the Red Cross or with any any other humanitarian uh, organization, with the UN, with UNICEF. Mm. Nobody knows. Mm. I've even heard uh, UNRWA says that Hamas has taken over some supplies that were meant to go to Palestinian civilians. So if Hamas doesn't care about Palestinian civilians, yeah, mm. I cannot be sure. I'm, I'm quite sure they don't care about Israeli civilians. And this is another thing that we have to understand, that Hamas doesn't care about Palestinian rights. They have nothing to do with wanting a solution for the Israeli-Palestinian crisis, conflict, a two-state solution. They don't care about that. They don't care about Palestinians. What do you want to see, Itai? Is it to see the Israeli military go in? Do you think the time for any sort of back-channeling is, is over and they've just got to move? First of all, I'm not, I'm not a politician and I'm not a military person, but in my opinion, we've seen this before, similar things. The, the Israeli army has gone into Gaza and things have happened again and again, over and over. I believe that the end goal should be some sort of agreement between the Israelis and Palestinians. And I'm talking about whoever is ruling the West Bank and not about Hamas, because again, Hamas is yeah. a terror organization. And we, the whole world must know that. And, and yeah, sorry. Yeah, it's a, I, I thank you for your time. I'm just going to update you and everyone else with what that Turkish foreign minister has been saying from Beirut. Uh, the latest we've got from him is a news conference. Decisions have been made to hold certain meetings, summits, to decide on steps that are necessary to be taken at this point. Tomorrow, there will be an extraordinary meeting of the foreign ministers of the Organization for Islamic Cooperation in Jeddah. On Saturday, there will be a summit held on the leaders' level in Cairo upon Egypt's invitation. So that's the latest we're getting from the man who is saying that clearly the hostages will be at the top of those talks. So maybe a little bit of hope for you all. Um, Ite Ravi, thank you very much indeed for joining us. We'll thank stay you in touch with you. Thank you for having me. Well, thank you. And, uh, of course, we'll keep you updated on those uh, uh, discussions going on in Beirut. Yeah, so, so, so courageous of him to talk to us during this time. OK, let's uh, just show you some live pictures from southern Israel looking towards Gaza where fresh plumes of smoke have just been seen. They might not be very clear to you now, but they have just been seen in the last few minutes. Yeah, there's been more rocket fire today uh, from Gaza into Israel, and we also have seen uh, what appear to be more uh, aerial explosions uh, with uh, perhaps Israeli airstrikes on various uh, areas. Rafa was hit to, uh, towards the south earlier today, but we'll keep you updated on this very fluid situation. Stay with us here on The Live Desk. We're here for the show. More energy this time. Welcome to the Dinosaur Hour. I was uh, married to a therapist. And you survived? I thought we were getting Hugh Laurie. Second best. <laughs> you interviewed Saddam Hussein. What's that like? I was terrified. I'm playing strip poker with these three. Oh! No, thank you. <laughs> My CDs need to be put in alphabetical order. Ah. Uh, are you going to be problematic again? <laughs> the Dinosaur Hour, Sunday the 29th of October at 9 on GB News. What you get for breakfast is something that, if we do our jobs right, you will wake up to news that you didn't know the night before. It's a conversation. It's not just me and Eamon. We want to get to know you, and we want you to get to know us. From 6, it's Breakfast with Eamon and Isabel. Monday to Thursdays on GB News. Britain's news channel.
People in Britain, they love free speech, but they also love fair play. I don't care if I'm speaking somebody from a trade union, from the Labour Party, somebody from the SNP. And I think the viewers like to see that actually we can challenge one another, but in a positive way. We think we ask the questions that people want to ask, and often we ask the questions that we wanted to ask in Parliament but never got the chance to ask. So join us every Saturday, 10 a.m. till noon on GB News, Britain's news channel. Nightmare Commute. Kick it up a gear with me, Patrick Christie's, at drive time, 3 till 6 p.m., Monday to Friday, on GB News Radio. You can listen online and on DAB+, Plus on the smart speaker app and on the GB News app. And if you've got an Alexa, all you have to say is, Alexa, play GB News. We're also on TuneIn and the Radio Player apps. From the school run to rush hour, get revved up with me, Patrick Christie's, on GB News and GB News Radio. Westminster is going around in ever-decreasing circles, followed by the media. Britain is broken. How on earth did we get into this mess? But more importantly, how do we get out of it? Join me at 7pm, Monday to Thursdays, on Farage, here on GB News. We will have open, rational debate. We've got to work out how Britain moves forward from this. Join us here on GB News, the people's channel. Britain is watching. Join me, Andrew Pearce and Bev Turner, Monday to Thursday, 9.30am. Who benefits from that? Not the British public. And on Fridays, join us, Tom Harwood and Ellie Costello from Britain's Newsroom. That's what you get with this show, that's fantastic. If it's happening, we're talking about it on Britain's Newsroom. GB News, Britain's news channel. GB News, unlike other broadcasters, isn't obsessed with the London Westminster bubble. We think there's a nation beyond the M25, and that's why we talk about the issues that matter across the land. Join me on State of the Nation, 8 to 9 o'clock, Monday to Thursday, on GB News. Daisy's listening, and you should too. Now then, Lee Anderson here. Join me on GB News on my show, The Real World, every Friday at 7 p.m. I'm not eating bloody cat. Are you Delicious. Mental? Open your mouth. OK, here comes a, <laughs> here comes a train. It reminds me of the scene in Singing in the Rain. Adam, is that a good one? <laughs> oh, whoa! Join me at 7 on GB News, Britain's news channel. Welcome back to the live desk. Some breaking news coming in from the Reuters news agency. We're quoting Hamas, actually, uh, about the uh, position of their armed commander in uh, Gaza. They are uh, saying that the Israeli airstrike has killed uh, a man, an individual, a terrorist, called Ayman Noval. Uh, a senior Hamas armed commander. No word yet as to, to where in Gaza it was, uh, but uh, that has just come in the last few moments. That Certainly, is yeah. the airstrike. Yeah, we saw uh, airstrikes on Rafa to the south of Gaza earlier and uh, more rocket fire being returned uh, into Israel. So clearly uh, these air attacks on both sides uh, have been continuing. But indications from Hamas itself that uh, one of their senior armed commanders, the Al-Quds brigades, as uh, they're called sometimes, Ayman Noval, has been killed in that attack. More as we get it. But let's reflect on events elsewhere in Europe with the police in Brussels shooting shooting dead a man who'd killed two Swedish nationals on Monday evening. Local media reporting that he's a 45-year-old Tunisian national, uh, Abdel Salam, and was shot at a cafe this morning. Brussels has been on its highest terror alert after yesterday's attack. In response, Prime Minister Alexander de Cruz said terrorists must understand that they will never succeed in their intent. Our Home and Security editor Mark White uh, joins us. Um, this has now led to the French president uh, saying that all European states are vulnerable and there is a resurgence of Islamist terrorism, he claims. There's certainly a concern that there could well be quite a significant uh, upsurge in the terrorist threat as a direct result of what is playing out in Israel and Gaza. Um, and that's why not just... France, but Belgium, the UK and other countries will be reviewing their counter-terrorism preparations, will be uh, with vigour looking again at those key suspects who might pose a potential threat. Uh, and we might well see here in the UK in the days ahead an increase in the terror threat level, currently standing at substantial 
uh, which is the sort of median range uh, for the terror threat indicator, uh, meaning a, an attack is likely. If it was to go up one notch, it would go to severe, meaning a terrorist attack is highly likely. And the Met indicating that will include more visible policing at, at Wembley for this next qualifier. Yeah, uh, regardless of the terror threat, they say directly in response to what happened in Brussels with the targeting, it seems, of two... Uh, football supporters who were fatally shot uh, from Sweden, uh, who were there for that uh, match between Sweden and Belgium, uh, that uh, the game against the uh, England and Italy, which is being played at Wembley tonight, that is going to have increased security personnel, very overt increased security around the stadium and more covert uh, increase in security as well. Do we have any idea what, what the motive was here and whether it is linked to this deepening crisis in, in Israel and Gaza? Well, certainly, uh, Belgian prosecutors believe that, yes, there may well be a link to the ongoing situation in Israel and Gaza. And, in fact, this man, Abdel Salam Lassoud, uh, made a video, a martyrdom video, just before he took part uh, in or perpetrated this terrorist attack. He said that part of his motivation was revenge for the murder of a Palestinian teenager in the United States in recent days, also saying that he is a supporter of the Islamic State. Mm. And an indication there that the threat from ISIS, although it's been severely degraded in recent years by Western coalition countries in Syria and Iraq, that threat has not gone away. And they continue, if not to launch attacks on their own, certainly to influence and radicalise others to carry out attacks in countries like Belgium, France, the UK. And I guess that explains why they are raiding various addresses uh, in, in Brussels uh, to try and establish whether there is a wider network. And, and we were reflecting earlier, Mark, of course, when we dial back to the Bataclan attack in Paris, French police involved with Belgian police in searching areas of Brussels at that time, where uh, it was a situation where they fled across the border to the suburbs. Yeah, that horrific attack, which resulted in 130 people died, many hundreds more uh, injured in those series of attacks, uh, culminating in the, the biggest loss of life at the Bataclan Theatre. That was masterminded uh, by a Belgian national. In fact, half of the 10 terrorists who took part yeah. were actually Belgian uh, uh, nationals or at least lived uh, in Belgium, uh, Belgium and then travelled to France to carry out these attacks. They have been grappling with an Islamist problem in Belgium uh, for many years now. Uh, they have uh, real concerns about... And, and France suffers from a similar issue, uh, the ghettoisation yes. of many of these Suburbs. communities, mm. which are breeding grounds uh, for extremism. And they've had not just... Uh, of course, involvement in these terrible atrocities that took place at the Bataclan and other venues in France, but their own uh, terrorist attacks in 2016 at the airport in Brussels and the subway system in which 32 people died and numerous other terrorist incidents. Yeah. Mark, thank you for that. Just being told the EU Parliament's been observing a minute's silence uh, in uh, respect of those two uh, Swede uh, nationals who died or, or killed. So that's just coming through. Uh, more, of course, as we get it on that, as we will uh, on this changing situation in Gaza. But let's get an update now on the latest news headlines with Aaron. It's 2.33. I'm Aaron Armstrong in the GB Newsroom. A British teenager was amongst those murdered by Hamas during its attack on Israel. Yahel Sharabi, on the right, who was 13, disappeared along with her sister Noya after militants attacked her kibbutz on the 17th of October and killed her British-born mother Leanne. Her elder sister and their father Eli are still missing. The Prime Minister Rishi Sunak has called for the immediate release of hostages. It's thought a further nine Britons are amongst some 200 people currently being held by Hamas. Well, aid agencies are warning of a deepening humanitarian catastrophe in Gaza amid fears the conflict will spread elsewhere in the Middle East. Palestinian authorities claim 80 people have been killed by Israeli airstrikes in South Gaza overnight, 
uh, the area where Israeli military have told civilians to take refuge. Hundreds of thousands have gathered near the Rafah crossing to Egypt, which remains closed. The UN believes Israel's siege of Gaza and its evacuation order could be in breach of international law, and it's warned that all hospitals there will run out of fuel within 24 hours. The World Health Organization says at least 2,800 people have been killed in Gaza. The return of Islamist terrorism poses a threat to all European nations. That's according to French President Emmanuel Macron. His comments come uh, a day after two Swedish people were shot and killed in a terror attack in Brussels. Belgian police say the suspect, who identified himself as a member of Islamic State, was shot and killed this morning. It happened in the city centre before Belgium's Euro 2024 qualifier against Sweden. And Greta Thunberg has been arrested after protesting against oil and gas companies in central London. The Swedish climate campaigner was taking part in a fossil-free London protest at a hotel on Park Lane, where oil executives were meeting for the Energy Intelligence Forum conference. Thunberg has this year been detained by police and removed from protests in Sweden, Norway and Germany. That's it for the moment. I'll be back with more in just under half an hour's time or you can get more on our website, gbnews.com. I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to ordinary people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels. We're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. The Live Desk with me, Mark Longhurst. And me, Pip Thompson. It's here Monday to Friday on GB News. From midday, we'll bring you the news as it breaks, whenever it's happening and wherever it's happening, from across the UK and around the world. Refreshing, feisty, but with a bit of fun too. If it matters to you, we'll have it covered on TV, radio and online. Join the Live Desk on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. So Jubes and Co, we tackle the issues of the day with real robust debate. Both sides of the fence, battling it out with me in the middle with my forthright opinions and views. And often really interesting things happen because you start with a position and then by the end of the debate, you find actually, well, I might not have thought about that one. What we need in this country is two new political parties. You should maybe think about doing a 2024 calendar. <coughs> I'm Michelle Jubry and I'm keeping you company right through until seven o'clock this evening. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's watching. Join us every night on GB News at 11pm for Headliners, which is three top comedians going through the next day's news stories, which is exactly what you need, because when the establishment has gone crazy, you need some craziness to make sense of it. Headliners. You don't have to bother reading the newspaper. We've got it covered for you. Every night at 11pm and repeated every morning at 5am. We won't send you to sleep like some of the other paper review shows out there. So join us 11pm every night on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's news channel. Join me, Camilla Tomini, on Sunday mornings from 9.30, taking the politicians to task and breaking out of SW1 to see how their decisions are affecting you across the UK. Bursting the Westminster bubble every Sunday morning, only on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's watching. Every Sunday from 11, join Michael Portillo. There will be topical discussion, looking at the week before and the week to come. So kick back and relax at 11 a.m. on Sundays on GB News with me, Michael Portillo. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Nightmare Commute. Kick it up a gear with me, Patrick Christie's, at drive time, 3 till 6 p.m., Monday to Friday on GB News Radio. You can listen online and on DAB Plus, on the Smart Speaker app and on the GB News app. And if you've got an Alexa, all you have to say is Alexa, play GB News. We're also on TuneIn and the Radio Player apps. From the school run to rush hour, get revved up with me, Patrick Christie's, on GB News and GB News Radio.
Welcome back to the live desk uh, here on GB News. Uh, let's reflect that uh, the Prime Minister told this morning's Cabinet meeting in Downing Street that Hamas was responsible for the murder and suspected abduction of British nationals. Well, one of those who's been killed, 13-year-old uh, girl Yahel Pitchard, uh, here on the left of your screen, uh, confirmed dead after those Hamas terrorists attacked her kibbutz, Kibbutz Beri. Her mother, Leanne, also seen there killed, but her sister, Noya, on the right, is still missing uh, officially. Responding to the unfolding humanitarian crisis, Downing Street has urged Israel to allow water into Gaza, but has refused to say whether the decision to shut off the supply was in line with international law. Well, let's get more now with the Assistant Professor of Diplomacy and Conflict Resolution at the Arab American University, Adalil Irakat. Thank you very much indeed uh, for your time. With President Biden due to fly tonight to arrive in Tel Aviv tomorrow and then to go on to Amman, uh, these um, talks then with leaders from both uh, Jordan uh, and Egypt and Palestinian leaders as well. Um, is this we think, to address the humanitarian aspect rather than try and find any diplomatic accord? Well, thank you. Um, we are watching day 11, where 2 million Palestinian civilians are facing collective punishment and war crimes. Let's, let's be clear. This is not a war against Hamas. This is a war against 2.2 million Palestinians who are living in an open-air prison of 365 square kilometers. 50 percent are children. One million children are deprived of the basic, basic needs of our human rights. After 16 years of this siege, they were left with no hope. So, and people in Gaza endured four more wars besides this one. A reflection of 75 years of the Israeli military occupation, apartheid, extrajudicial killings, detentions, confiscations, settler terrorism, all under a package of a military occupation. You know, what, is we, what we are witnessing today is an ethnic cleansing of the Palestinian people. For the yeah, let, 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 me, let me just interrupt, and, and let's reflect that President Biden and the Americans and others have indicated that the action that's being taken is against Hamas and not the Palestinian people of, of Gaza. They can say, and unfortunately, Netanyahu had succeeded, you know, in branding this, his war crimes, the series of war crimes of forced displacements and evictions and collective punishment as a, a war against, against Hamas. Why would Netanyahu and sophisticated, high-tech Israel wipe out 2 million Palestinians, you know, displace 1.1 million, 1,000 I'm, 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 I'm going to interrupt you. 2 million Palestinians it's have easy. not been wiped out. If you are going to make your case, please stick no, to the facts. Lying. They've not been wiped out. I am. I am sticking by facts. The fact that he is bombing every residential area, hospitals, mosques, churches, and he's evicting hospitals and inpatients. He is trying to do a second Nakba in the 21st I'm afraid, century. I'm afraid I'm going to correct you as, again. As far as we are aware, hospitals have not been directly targeted as we are aware. Clearly, there is a, sincere, sent, a serious and sustained bombardment going on. But as far Did as we are aware, hospitals Did have not the been targeted. Statements? Listen, no, I, we have evidence. The St. John's Group Hospital, the I, the St. John's, the British Hospital in Jerusalem, it hasn't been destroyed totally, but there are significant uh, damages. Please stick to the truth. You know, many other hospitals, and go follow the WHO statements yesterday. Many doctors and many inpatients are suffering no electricity, no water, no uh, dial dialysis uh, machines. Those are under uh, death, you know, and everybody is, is watching. We're talking about international law. Yes, I would like to go back to diplomacy and international law. Yeah, yes. What Cle we are clearly... witnessing is violation. Thank you. It's Cle a violation clearly... to the international humanitarian law. Clearly, I'm, like I'm just going to interrupt you again. Clearly, those doctors that we have spoken to within Gaza say it is a desperate humanitarian position, and yes, they are supplying or, or running short of supplies, and they are running short of power and fuel for the generators. But as far as we are aware, they are not saying that the Israelis have directly bombed those hospitals. We have to make that plain. OK, I am happy to share with you footages of the St. John's Hospital in, in Gaza and the other hospitals also in Gaza where doctors, actually a Canadian-Palestinian doctor, his name is Abu Sitta, and he had been on air showing and, and putting testimonies for the doctors, their, their families, who took refuge in the hospitals. Listen, Israel is not shy to say that they sent forced displacement orders and eviction orders to the hospitals and to the doctors in Gaza. What we need to remind the world 
that Israel is not acting by the law or by the international law. It's violating every law. You know, Article 49 in the uh, for Geneva Convention, Just Article 146, Article 56, they are violating every single article. Oh, can I just can I just jump in and Let ask you because it was only point. ten days ago, Dalal? Please just stop talking for one second. I just want to ask you. It was only ten days ago that uh, there was a terrorist atrocity. Uh, all those families in the kibbutzes, the people at the music festival. Do you accept that that was a terrorist atrocity committed by Hamas? It's amazing how the West bias had introduced... No, it's not about West bias. It's not about West bias. It's asking listen, you, do you think it was a week, terrorist atrocity? Violent, what, violent, what do you call violent, it? This is the, listen, you can call it whatever you want to call what it. What do you For call me, it? It's about the human's lives. Nobody has Absolutely, the right to terminate it's about human human lives. Lives. God. Absolutely, so fact, it's about human's exactly. lives. It's about so human's fact, lives on both that, sides of this. So the fact, yes, but, of course. So what, yes, do you do, so what happened ten day. days ago? The what fact, do you call, what listen, do you describe that as? Fact, do you accept that that was a terrorist act? I just told you, act? it's a reflection. I just told you, it's a reflection of sixteen years of deadly blockade and seventy-five years of Israeli military occupation of every kind of military racist and apartheid regime against the Palestinian people. Again, Article. 49 of the Four Geneva Convention, the Palestinian civilians are entitled to protection and to yeah. humanitarian assistance. Israel is not letting the humanitarian assistance go into Gaza. What I am telling you that in face of the humanity, we should not allow, we should not tolerate the fact that 2 million Palestinians are now facing the war crime of genocide while we are documenting it on screens. This is what the whole world should be saying no to, should be saying enough to. And, and, and listen, we do, we do I, reflect, we do reflect that the listen, United Nations listen, has raised so this, true. yeah, that we do reflect that the United Nations has raised this issue about the way that people are being forcibly moved into the south of Gaza, and they are raising this as, as uh, international on concern. The, the can, I, can I just ask you, because you are the daughter of Saib Erekat, the Palestinian politician, uh, that we do have these meetings tomorrow and into perhaps uh, later into the weekend, including including Palestinian uh, officials. Is there any hope that the Palestinian Authority, who are in the West Bank at the moment, can be brought into the equation in terms of Gaza if Hamas are removed? Would that be a solution? Thank you very much. Diplomacy and multilateral diplomacy had failed the people here in Palestine. My late father had dedicated all his life to negotiations, diplomacy and dialogue. Yeah. He promised his people dignity, freedom and statehood. Sadly enough, he had to leave this world without realizing his dreams. What do you tell the Palestinian people after 30 years of negotiations of a sugar-coated peace process, where on the ground we have a more entrenched military occupation with more racist policies, more settlements, more confiscations of land, more extrajudicial killing? We are living a mere and entrenched Israeli military occupation. We need to deal with the root cause of what we are witnessing today. It's about ending the Israeli yes. occupation. Okay. How would anybody be able to ask we Israel are, we to are, draw We are going to leave it there because the, 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 the situation is, of course, that Hamas was the administration in Gaza. There was no Israeli uh, uh, occupation as recognized by the international community, but that is your view. But thank you, you very much indeed for joining us from the Arab American <laughs> University. Thank you very much. Uh, just to make sure that uh, we understand what the position is, of course, uh, as uh, accepted by the United States and the United Nations, there is no occupation as such of Gaza. It is being uh, run at the moment by Hamas as the authority there. Let's talk to former National Security Advisor of Israel and fellow at the Jewish Institute of National Security of America. That's Yaakov Amidror. Uh, Yaakov... Let's ask you, first of all, about President Biden's trip tomorrow. What do you think his approach is going to be and what he is going to achieve here? I think the President Biden visit is a very important event. I think that the Americans have um, different three goals. One is to make clear to the world that America stands with Israel. It's important to signal it to the world and more important to signal it to the Iranians that might consider um, intervening in the in the war. The second reason of, of the of the visit is to show the sympathy of the American people to the Amer to the Israeli people after the um, barbarian attack of Hamas 
And knowing the father of the lady which spoke uh, before, I'm sure that he would condemn it totally. She was not ready to do it. Um, he was a tough negotiator, but he understood the difference between brutality and barbarian methods and um, the needs of the Palestinians. That does not uh, serve the needs of the Palestinians. And right. anyhow, ya for, uh, the, for the Americans, for the Americans, it's very important to show the sympathy to the to the Israeli people. But last and not least, the Americans understand that this war is not just about the needs of Israel for security. Yes, this is the main the main issue for the Israelis. But the Americans understand that this is um, aggressive attempt by the coalition of Iran, Hezbollah. Uh, Islamic Jihad um, and, and Hamas to show the world that the alliances which are emerging in the Middle East between the rest of America, Israel, Saudi Arabia and other countries yeah. which are which want to have the status quo in the Middle East and are against the, the, um, the um, um, aggressiveness of Iran, they, they will not succeed. Yeah, and, and, and there was very important. There was this growing one, accord. One sentence, there was sentence, this growing accord sentence. with Israel, which uh, with uh, Saudi Arabia and Israel, that may have, and as you say, um, frightened. If we could use that phrase. But can I please ask you the question I put to Deval Irakat as well, and that is the role of the Palestinian Authority currently, as we see more explosions in Gaza City, currently in the West Bank, because we know these Palestinian officials will be meeting President Biden. Is that a long-term solution to move the Palestinian Authority back? into Gaza? I hope in 2006 the Palestinians in Gaza elected Hamas as their government. The majority of the parliament was elected by the people in, in Gaza and they gave it the majority to Hamas. Hamas expelled the Fatah members, uh, shot in their knees, pushed them from the roofs and Hamas and the, and the uh, Palestinian Authority does not exist in, the, in, the, in Gaza Street. For Israel, it will be a very good solution. For the Palestinians, it will be a very good solution. But for that, Israel should finish the job of um, annihilating Hamas as a military organization. Only afterwards, the Palestinian Authority can come in and take responsibility yeah. for Gaza Strip. OK, Yaakov, thank you very much indeed for bringing us uh, your side of the uh, intractable position, of course, that many find themselves in on the political front. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Now, back here, Downing Street has urged Israel to allow water into Gaza, but has refused to say whether the decision to shut off the supply was in line with international law. Well, Christopher Hope joins us now from Downing Street. With Christopher, as you were saying, number 10 trying to, well, tread a very fine line on this. Yeah. It's very hard, Mark, for Britain, for what, number 10, to know what to do. They've got to support the right for Israel to defend itself and also to, to get to rescue uh, any hostages in, 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 in Gaza. But equally, there's a right to have water, um, and that's a real problem. Of course, the, the southern border remains closed into Egypt. That's a further issue. Of where do these people go? And behind me in, in the Cabinet meeting this morning, uh, Mr Sunak, the PM, Richard Sunak, made very clear that the, the government now does believe that some British nationals have been abducted and taken hostage um, in, in Gaza. We don't know how many there are. We know there are six dead and we know there are ten missing. We asked them how many hostages there might be. They wouldn't say. Now, earlier in Westminster here, we had a, a visit from um, Israeli families who met with the, leader of the leaders of the Labour Party. That's Sir Keir Starmer, the leader, uh, Angela Rayner, the, the deputy leader, David Lammy, the shadow foreign secretary, and Lisa Nandy, the, the international development secretary. Um, they were Limor Celebroida, Reuter Maor, Nurit Retta, and Shana Segal. And they met earlier, and here's what they had to say to us outside. We have 10 family members from Kibbutz Berry and two family members from Kibbutz Nahal Oz that were taken Saturday morning. We have no recollection of anything. We don't have um, any news of their whereabouts or state that they're in. We don't know if they're dead or alive, if they're wounded. We don't know if they're dry or fed, if they got their medicine. Um, we have um, three children, eight years old, three year old, a 12-year-old and a teenager, 17. She's supposed to celebrate her 18th birthday on the 24th of this month, and we don't know where they are. We don't know anything about them. She was texting to the family. Her daughter was talking to her. Her daughter said that there were noises in the last half an hour she was there, and then the contact uh, disconnected. We couldn't text her anymore. 
and there was nothing, nothing from her till Monday morning when they allocated the mobile. But I was, my sister, we don't know if she's... We don't even know if she's alive. We don't know if she's, if she's hurt, alive. If she's she, you know, she's nothing, getting take, oral needs are taken care of. She's being fed. If she's warm, nothing. Nothing. 8.30 in the morning on a Saturday, October 7th. That was the last time that we heard from my cousin. A few hours later, um, the army were in control of the kibbutz, and then they found their house covered with bullets, blood, and they were gone. Now, Limo uh, Seller Broder there, she has a family of 12 people missing. That's, so, that's a huge number of the 200 the Israeli government say are missing. Of course, the families think there are 300 missing. They told that to the Labour Party this morning. Sadly, the UK government couldn't offer a minister up to meet them. Uh, Lord Ahmed was offered, but not no one behind me in 10 Downing Street. But the hope is that, number, that uh, Mr Sunak can meet families uh, involved in this conflict, conflict as soon as tomorrow. Chris, uh, in Downing Street, thank you very much indeed for that. Uh, let's bring you the latest pictures we've got uh, looking towards Gaza uh, with uh, reports that you can see more smoke in the left-hand side of Gaza City. But further south, residents reporting there have been more Israeli air attacks on the cities of Rafah and Khan Yunis in the area, of course, that they had told people uh, to move to to keep safe. The US President Joe Biden in the next few hours is heading to Israel and Jordan, a whirlwind trip where he will be focusing on that expected Israeli ground offensive and this growing humanitarian crisis. Stay with us. Who is it? We're here for the show. <laughs> Welcome to the Dinosaur Hour. I was uh, married to a therapist. And you survived? I thought we were getting Hugh Laurie. Second best. <laughs> you interviewed Saddam Hussein. What's that like? I was terrified. I'm playing strip poker with these three. Oh! No, thank you. <laughs> My CDs need to be put in alphabetical order. Ah. Uh, Are you going to be problematic again? <laughs> the Dinosaur Hour. Sunday, the 29th of October at 9 on GB News. What you get for breakfast is something that, if we do our jobs right, you will wake up to news that you didn't know the night before. It's a conversation. It's not just me and Eamon. We want to get to know you, and we want you to get to know us. From 6, it's breakfast with 